on camera. I'll be careful what you do. Good morning, everyone, members of council and members of the public and folks watching at home. Uh, this is the meeting of Committee of Council for January 16th, 2019. I remind everyone that today's meeting, we ask you to please ensure that all cell phones and other electronic devices are turned off or placed in a non-audible mode during the meeting. Uh, to begin the meeting, we have uh, approval of the agenda. There are several changes and updates to the agenda, and we'll ask the clerk to give us a summary of those changes. Mr. Chair, members of committee, members of staff and public uh, attending or watching today's meeting, these are the changes to today's agenda. Uh, under approval of the agenda, I, I wish to point out that there is a delegation from, that's identified on the updated agenda, 10.4.1 from SNAPSO that is requesting that a deferred item on today's agenda, 10.2.2, be removed from the agenda. So uh, normally my advice on that would be is one, you could remove it from the agenda if there's an intent that it come back in the future, but if there isn't, and you just wish to deal with the report, then you would just receive it and take no action on that report. So, do, do members have a desire uh, to remove the item from the agenda? Councillor Fertini? Yeah, I'm going to remove it from the agenda. Go ahead, Councillor. Oh, okay. So we have a mo uh, request to remove it from the agenda. Do we need a vote for that? We do. We can do that okay. with all the Okay, others. so all in favor of removing staff so from the agenda this morning? Carries. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. So in terms of other updates to the agenda, there are um, added delegations under 6.3 on the updated agenda, and this is in regard to item 10.2.1, uh, affirming a surplus declaration for two blocks of land. Uh, there are a total of five delegations, which are shown on the screen, which have come in, uh, and those delegations will be considered under item 6.3, and then with consideration with report 10.2.1. There also is additional correspondence identified as 10.4.2 on the updated agenda. And at the last count, there were six different pieces of correspondence in regard to this item. Uh, we have an, a new delegation, which is identified as 6.4 on the updated agenda on the screen. And that's a delegation in regards to report 7.2.2, an arm's length organization for arts, culture, and creative industry development in Brampton. Um, further uh, updates to the agenda. I will go through and item 8.2.4, which is a staff report on community recognition program and 2020 commemorative dates. There was an update, uh, a formatting issue with Appendix B, so that's been replaced uh, and corrected on the online version of the agenda. And finally, um, I've mentioned uh, item 10.2.1. There's a number of delegations and correspondence in regards to that item. Um, committee has just removed item 10.2.2 from the agenda. And uh, these are the additional pieces of correspondence uh, that have already been referenced, and those are the changes at the moment, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. So we are now at a agenda, approval of the agenda. Do any members have items that they would like to have added, removed? I see Councillor Singh on the board. Councillor. Hey, yep. Um, I would like to add just a very brief, uh, very, very brief discussion on um, apologies, on the uh, hospital and healthcare in Brampton. So, Mr. Chair, then that potentially could be a proposed item under the corporate services section under new businesses, item 8.3.3. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Next up, I have Councillor Santos. Thank you. Through you, uh, Chair, I would like to uh, refer item 8.2.2, third quarter operating budget and reserve fund status report for council meeting next week, January 22nd. Um, and also would like to refer item 13.2, in-camera discussion um, to council next week for when the mayor returns. So noted by the clerk. Seeing no other changes, so you have the agenda. Uh, do you need to review the agenda one more time, uh, Mr. Clerk, or for good there? We're not voting on yeah. All right. So approval of the agenda. All in favor? Oh, uh, <clears throat> Councillor Plushen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can we go back to the referrals that we're about to vote on? 
Can we get those items again? It was item 8.2.2, third quarter operating budget and reserve fund status report. And Mr. Clerk, if I'm not mistaken, item 13.2, which is an in camera item. So just bear with me while I check on what items those are. 13 point which, sir? It would be 13.2. It is advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary to that purpose. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. So all in favor of the agenda as amended. Need to see hands. Carried. Members of Council, our members of committee, our next item is declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Does any member have a conflict, conflict of interest to declare? Seeing none, uh, let the clerk please note that for the minutes. Our next item on the agenda is consent. Items listed with an asterisk are considered routine and non-controversial by committee. Do any members have items that they would like to add or remove from the consent agenda? Councillor Singh. Uh, I'll add 7.2.1 unless anybody has a disagreement uh, into consent. It's good news, and I don't think we need a discussion on it, but that's up to counselor. Which is this? We've had a request to add item 7.2.1, sponsorship agreement, oh. into consent. Seeing no other changes, all in favor? Carries. We have uh, no announcements today, uh, no government relation matters, so we move into delegations. Um, Mr. Clerk, we have a possible delegation in item 6.1, public notice of a bylaw to amend a designate bylaw subject to administrative penalties. Do we have any members of the public here to delegate today? Seeing none, we move on to item 6.2, a delegation from Roy Prince. Brampton resident regarding the Brampton Sports Hall of Fame nominations. Welcome, Mr. Prince. It's been a long time. Welcome. Anyway, um, I, just to give you some background, 25 years ago, I coached Chris uh, for the minor, for the Pee Wee AAA team in Brampton. We were known as the Maroons. We had, we had a fabulous team back then, back when we lost four games all year, and obviously he made quite an impact on me. So um, just to give you some background on what he did in the hockey world, he was the leading scorer on the national men's under-18 team. He was a member of the Ontario men's under-17 team. He was a member of the Belleville Bulls OHL championship team. He ranked 20, 22nd on the American Hockey League all-time scoring record. He played 75 games uh, over eight seasons with the Leafs, Toronto, uh, New York Rangers, Detroit Red Wings, Philadelphia Flyers, <clears throat> and he is the only Brampton base player to play in the NHL for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Just to give you some background, I, um, I first nominated Chris for the Sports Hall of Fame in March 2016. He wasn't retired at that time, however, I noted that four inductees were still playing, so I felt confident that he would be accepted given his outstanding professional career. The committee subsequently advised me that my nomination, <coughs> excuse me, was not accepted because he was still an active player. <coughs> I, uh, excuse me. I asked for clarification concerning the four inductees who were still playing, and the response was that they were accepted because they had received medals at a World Amateur or Olympic event. I responded that Chris also had received a gold medal at the men's national under-18 Four Nations Cup tournament and was the leading scorer. The committee's response was that the under-18 gold medal didn't count as it wasn't a World International Amateur Federation event. I advised them that there was no international, it's called IAAF event in 1999. That designation only commenced in 2002 and I received no response. <clears throat> Chris officially retired in April 2019, so I decided to resubmit my nomination to the committee for his induction into the Brampton Sports Hall of Fame. 
As a result, I was subsequently advised that the committee would meet with me on November 7th. I advised them that I would be out of the country on that date, so it would be later set to December 5th. Prior to that meeting, I provided the committee with a comprehensive written submission. Um, I met with the committee on December 5th and was allowed five minutes to provide a presentation. I wondered if the members had a copy of my written submission, why I wasn't asked questions or have a discussion. I also noted that several key members of the committee were missing, including one of the co-chairs. The result of the meeting was that there was no support from the committee to exempt Chris from the three-year waiting period, as they had done for the other four players. Now, Chris's accomplishments at the Under-18 Team Canada uh, event, that they won gold at the 1999 Four Nations Cup, was impressive. His coach was Stan Butler, who was inducted on May uh, 1, 2012, to the Brampton Sports Hall of Fame. Part of the, pr of the rationale for Butler's induction was outlined in the preamble, which stated, in 1999, he became the head coach for the under-18 team Canada's side that won gold at the Four Nations Cup. And I wondered to myself, does this count for Butler's admission? Why doesn't it count for Chris? Three of the four inductees are still playing hockey, are outstanding hockey players. And they were inducted at or near the beginning of their professional careers, which was 18 years to 20 based on their receipt of medals at the World International or Olympic event. Now, Chris received his medal at 18 years of age at the World International event, <clears throat> and a nomination for the a Brampton Sports Hall of Fame induction would have been ridiculous at that time because he was similar to the 300 inductees who was just embarking on his hockey career. Chris completed 16 years of an outstanding professional career won a gold medal at a world international event, and obviously wasn't admitted to the Brampton Sports Hall of Fame prematurely at age 18. Now, I've gone on about, uh, what's the hurry? Why don't, why don't you wait three years? What I'm my, my position is basically you've done it for four other people, four other outstanding hockey players, but you don't want to do it for Chris. That's, that's where I'm at right now. Um, I'm, I'm requesting that he be admitted to the Brand Sports, Sports Hall of Fame, excuse me, in May of this year, for the reasons already discussed. Um, I don't know what else to tell you. That's what it is. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Thank you very much for that delegation. Uh, I think that we can have that refer to the Sports Hall of Fame Committee for consideration at a future sitting of their meeting. I need a motion to receive the delegation and move the referral from Councillor Willens. All in favor? Carries. Our next delegation is Delegation 6.3. And we have uh, Mr. Jason Samuels and Rochelle Samuels. Sorry, through you, Mr. Chair. There, there are five delegations listed for this item. Oh, there are the, several delegations. Yeah, the, the first is Christine Gerber, a Brampton resident, followed by Rosemary Keenan, Director of Sierra Club of, of Ontario, Peel Group, followed by the Castlemore Residents Group, uh, 2585426 Ontario, represented by uh, Frank Carboni, Steve Kirby, and a number of other residents. Um, Mithu Modi, who's a Brampton resident, and then there is one additional person of the group, Rochelle and Jason Samuels. So if uh, folks are here to delegate to item 10.2.1, please come forward and give us your name, and you each have five minutes. Welcome. Thank you. Please give us your name for the record. Yes, I'm Christine Gerber. I'm wondering if it's possible to have an extra minute and a half. I'm reading my document. Do members of the committee wish to move for additional time for this delegation? I think we'll, we have a motion from Councillor Dillon. All in favor? Carries. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Well, good morning again, Councillor, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak once again on behalf of my family and other residents of the Castlemore Golf Club uh, community. So I live at 66 Tree Line, and it's one house removed from one of the parcels of lands being discussed today, those being blocks 109 and 99. 
I realize that these lands and whether they should be sold to the developers as access points for building on the golf course is the focus here today. However, as a resident, it is difficult to address that subject as completely as separate from the, the larger issue of the building project that these lands will help to facilitate, and which has been the cause of great stress and cost to the residents, among other things. As such, if you would permit me, I'd like to share our family's story as one among many of our neighbors and friends who have endured several years of pain and disruption to our lives. I come from the islands where outdoor living is just a way of life and where hospitality and welcoming others into our homes is daily normative behavior. So naturally, my husband and I had dreamed of living in a place where we could enjoy a bit of the outdoor life and share that with our family and friends. We chose our home almost entirely based on the premise that it looked onto some green space and allowed us an opportunity to breathe a little freer and to offer it as a space to others to enjoy a sense of peace and connection as well. I feel that there is little other premise left on which to make my appeal except for that of mercy and compassion. Those of us who have been the original owners moved into our new homes with great joy and anticipation of raising our family and for many of us we held the hope of our new homes becoming the family homestead way into our retirement years. Solely based on living in a golf, on a golf course community with green space, these homes were never intended as transitional homes, but rather as a mark of stability and community, truly a place to call home. However, it would be only a few years after moving in before all our dreams would be threatened by the sale of the golf course and the constant uncertainty, battling, and insecurity that, that followed. For our family, this uncertainty over many years and the constant worrying of what was going on on the other side of our fence became a source of tension and at times became stress points in our marriage. Along with our neighbors, after a year or two, we had purchased additional land from the original golf course owners so that we might be able to extend our backyard, possibly install a pool, a hot tub, and extended deck. Our family truly loved our home, but as the uncertainty grew, these decisions, which were originally part of our desires and plans when we moved in, became points of stress, tension, and disagreement as we considered no longer being able to enjoy these things in the surrounding we had originally invested in. We were continually in a state of limbo, causing frustration in our family relationships. In our particular situation, this building project has an added dimension. In our present circumstance, we currently have three neighbors looking directly into various parts of our home. We have two neighbors to the south, one of which looks directly into our ensuite bathroom on the second floor and directly into our dining room on the first floor. We look into their kitchen and dining room and their bedroom. Our second neighbor to the south looks into our kitchen and master bedroom and we into their kitchen and one of their bedrooms. With our other neighbor on the north side, we simply look into each other's second bedrooms. And we have a third neighbor also to the south side whose backyard is open to us. So most windows in the private areas of our home have to remain closed at all times. If this development does go through, we will be boxed in on all three sides with the potential of our only bit of remaining privacy in the house being threatened as well. The only thing that has kept us has been our original reason for purchasing this open space behind us. As it is, even sitting on our deck is anything but private, both visibly and audibly. We currently have three backyards that are joined to ours and a fourth that is completely open to us. As a community member, I have attended meetings here and have been excited at the talk of building a community that is putting the needs of Bramptonians first, of building a future where people can embrace doing life together and where health, fitness, and wellness, and the wellness of our community takes a, a place of prominence and where green spaces are an integral part of each community. I believe that this development flies in the face of all that the city and we as Bramptonians say we want to build. Lastly, I want to appeal to council to stand with the residents where possible through hearts of compassion. If nothing else, please put yourselves in our shoes and for a moment consider what it would be like if this was your family having struggled in unrest for most of your 19 years of living in your home. 
Please consider these parcels of land being discussed as a way of standing with, with the residents and compensating us in a small way for the many years of stress and turmoil to our mental health which cannot be measured in dollars. Please pr preserve this last bit of space between the houses for something that can be beneficial to us as residents. We have spent many agonizing years of stress, additional finance, and loss of the enjoyment of our homes, even stress between neighbors, not to mention the ultimate uh, loss of our dreams and plans, and there seems to be no one, no one to stand with the little guys while the big guys with all the money run over us with no regard for what really matters, people and families. I know that if this was the school ground or any other sphere of, of life, this kind of influence and bullying would not be tolerated. If the land is sold to the developer, not only will we have the complete loss of everything we worked to have as part of enriching our lives and those of others within our sphere of influence, but we would also now have much busier streets that where we're already unsafe for children. We will have much more noise and pollution as well as the loss of every accessible green space within a kilometer when we already don't don't have enough green space for the current number of homes. This development will reduce the value of our properties, but if it does go ahead, please consider requiring that some accommodation of buffer space be made and that the lot sizes and homes remain consistent with the current neighborhood and not further devalue our properties. I beg of you to have mercy on us and to do whatever can be still done to help us as residents who have been forced to relinquish our investments and our dreams of living with a degree of open space and retiring with our grandchildren, sharing the joy and ability to see just a little bit of wildlife and a few trees behind us. This is my delegation. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. We now invite the next delegation to come forward. Ms. Keenan, welcome. Good morning. Um, so my name is Rosemary Keenan, and I'm the director of our local Sierra Club group. Sierra Club is the nationwide leading voice for natural heritage protection, environmental best practices, and sustainable development. Sierra Club Ontario Peel Group is our local group. In 2007, we delegated for protection of the former Castlemore Golf Club lands along the West Humber. We continue to view these lands as a valuable asset for the city of Brampton, part of a connected natural corridor that supports wildlife and biodiversity. Each of us has a special place of natural wonder that we remember from our childhood. It may be a forest where we climbed trees and hung upside down from the branches, it may be a meadow full of wildflowers and bugs and snakes and blackberry bushes. It might be a lake where we watch ducks and geese splashing and dabbling, or a local creek with minnows and tadpoles and water gliders. The miracles of nature were at our fingertips. Children and families need these special outdoor places. We must protect them where they still exist in our urbanized environment. You may be familiar with that hit song from 1970, written, composed, and recorded by Joni Mitchell. You don't know what you've got till it's gone. They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Let's not allow the Castlemore lands to become another subdivision squeezed into a space that is much more valuable as green space for nearby residents. In the spirit of nurturing neighborhoods, proudly promoted by this council, this land should be protected. What does the city's Nurturing Neighborhoods program tell us? It tells us that people, and I quote, are at the heart of everything we do. It's our residents who are the experts when it comes to the environment they live in. And their everyday experiences in Brampton shape their quality of life. Our Nurturing Neighborhoods program encourages residents to have meaningful conversations with the city about what's awesome and what needs to change. In the spirit of nurturing neighborhoods, best practices dictate that the Castlemore lands in question be acquired by the city. They provide a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for an enhanced, connected, natural heritage area along the West Humber River, extending from Clareville Conservation Area at Brampton's southern border through the planned Eco Park north of Queen Street East, then on through northeast Brampton to Caledon in an area of the city that is underserved in terms of park space access to green space along the west humber 
is a necessity and would serve as a major step forward in the City of Brampton uh, Grow Green Master Plan. And to quote the Grow Green Master Plan, the success of a community's natural landscape will be measured by its biological diversity and landscape health, clean air and water, recreation and education opportunities, flood protection and mitigation, erosion control, wildlife habitat and genetic diversity. In 2017, Greenbelt protection was extended to 21 major, uh, major urban river valleys and seven coastal wetlands along across the GTHA and the Greater Golden Horseshoe, from Port Hope to Niagara. River valleys connect the suburban and rural lands, that's us, of the Greenbelt to Lake Ontario and provide our communities with green space to explore. They clean and filter our water and air, reduce our flood risks and provide a home to wildlife. Protecting the urban river valleys is the first step to ensure these systems remain healthy for generations to come. Commendably, the City of Brampton recognized the importance of the urban river valley greenbelt designation with signage at crossings of the Credit, Etobicoke and Humber rivers. As, the climate change, as climate change impacts us more and more severely, it is essential that we preserve and utilize the remaining green spaces in our city to help us ride out the storms. Following council endorsement of the Brampton 2040 vision in the spring of 2018, the city released a public survey asking for feedback on which of the Brampton 2040 visions or themes the city should prioritize. Sustainability and the environment came out on top. We respectfully request that the city acquire the Castlemore lands and engage Brampton residents in stewardship activities that will ensure a healthy natural green space along the West Humber for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much for your delegation. Welcome, sir. Please give us your name for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Mitu Modi, and I speak for the trees. For the trees have no voice. Please stop chopping them down. I was supposed to be chopping them down, please, because it rhymes, but I screwed it up. Anyway, it's a bit late for that now. All the trees along that um, corridor have been destroyed. They were a thing of beauty. You drive up Morel there, and right in front of you as you came up was a gorgeous willow tree. It's gone. It's destroyed. Other residents have talked about enjoying the natural space, enjoying the community. This is very real. You know, we talk about building a better Brampton and anyone I talk to outside of um, the Brampton area regards Brampton as uh, almost a dead zone. It's, it lacks beauty anywhere. It's, it's miles and miles of suburban, uh, practically a desert. We chose this area because it wasn't like that. It did have beauty. That willow was gone. There are ash trees that have been completely destroyed. Um, and this does have impact uh, on the residents. We talk about uh, being able to have a local green space. There's really, there actually is nowhere uh, within walking distance for the people along Dunwoods, along uh, Tree Line, along Morel to have a community space. Um, the closest one is nearby uh, my son's school, uh, previous school, uh, Tree Line. You go along there, community activity. There's kids playing, there's uh, all kinds of stuff happening in the evening. What happened in our area, that one lot that is being um, decided upon, that's where people would congregate. We would actually go there, not the little tiny park or the other little areas that they've designated. That's where kids would go to play soccer. That's where we had our garage sale, um, the, our street garage sale to, to raise funds. That's where people congregate. That's the only place we actually have. It's a little lot where people just go. Um, destroying that would actually have impact on people. The second voice I'd like to, to talk about is the voice of democracy. Um, we have spent years here. Uh, I've come and spoken before. Uh, other delegations have come, and we're all frustrated at this point. 
we have had a ruling in favor of us only to have it overturned. Um, today, I brought my son, Rohan, raise hand, one of the few young peoples you see in the audience. He's come out of school to come to see what's going on here. I can't really say anything to him. I can't tell him. Yeah, you go, you talk, and what will happen in the end? You lose, okay? Is this democracy? Is this how the system should work? What message are we sending to him? At this point, we're all very frustrated. Um, we, as in my family and uh, our children, we're voters. We come out, we vote any chance we get because we want our voices heard. And at this point in time, we feel like we're not being heard. So we're not asking anymore. We're demanding. We need this. And if we don't see a change, you've got five voters from our family that is not going to vote for this administration if it's not supporting us anymore. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Please give us your names for the record. Yes. Jason and Rochelle Samuels. Thank you. Um, my wife's a much better reader, so she wrote something. She's going to read to you guys here. But he made me cry, so now, <laughs> now I don't know how to. Okay, we'll try. Okay, good morning. Um, we are Jason and Rochelle Samuels. We have two little boys, ages... Sorry. Ages four <laughs> and two. We live at four, four Donwoods Court, which is um, on, on the map there, the yellow mark on your left-hand side. Our, our home is to the right of that. Um, go ahead. We question the city's motivation behind selling the parcels now. Developers want to build homes behind us on the old golf course. We've been told that developers want to build a road through Block 99 into the proposed development. The developers snuck in days before Christmas and tore down all the trees on the proposed development site. Do they in the city know something that the rest of us don't? Of major concern to us is the misinformation that has been presented about the city previ previously offering the parcels of land for sale and the level of interest that the adjacent owners had. For example, the following incorrect statement is contained in the background of this meeting's agenda. To paraphrase, it reads, between 2007 and 2012, city staff undertook efforts to find purchasers for blocks the intention at the time was to market the blocks as having the potential to create two separate residential lots. The blocks were subsequently marketed for sale, although adjacent landowners expressed interest in the blocks due to the blocks being encumbered by easements, which would be costly to relocate. The standalone development potential of the blocks was limited and no formal offers to purchase were received. We come here today to clarify, yes, we did express an interest. However, the lot was not marketed to us as having the potential to create a residential lot. We had no discussion with any other person from the planning office about development plans, options, challenges, or that they were expecting a formal offer. We purchased our home in 2011. In 2012, we were sent a letter signed by Jessica Kwan, development planner, of the Planning and Building Division. The letter stated that the city just was just inquiring to see what interest there would be if they put the parcel land for sale, up for sale. We were advised that we were offering half of the land, they were offering half of the land to us and half to the other adjacent owner. We indicated in the letter that we would be interested, and as instructed, we signed and mailed the letter back to the city. We were then contacted by phone and were given an approximate price of the land and advised that the city was just trying to determine what the level of interest was. We again said that we were interested and we would like to know what the property taxes would be for the land. The person we spoke with did not know and he said that he would have to get back to us. We never received a response. We are standing here today to clarify that we are still interested in purchasing half of the lot provided that is offered at fair market value and provided that we are given the additional property tax details that we had originally requested. Our intentions for purchasing the lot is in an attempt to save it from development, as green space is severely lacking in our neighborhood. This particular parcel is used in every season by both children and adults as a place to play, exercise, and to relax. Unfortunately, the next closest green space to allow for this is Treeline Park, which is about a 15-minute walk away. It is even longer and more daunting if you're walking with young children like I have. This walk requires the crossing of 10 different roadways where rolling stops, lack of stops, and speeders can make this journey risky, even for an adult. 
then once you get there, the park is often overcrowded. We are mutually in agreement that there's an urgent need for the Brampton's environmental master plan to protect the environment qualities of Brampton's built and natural landscapes. We would like to see the city follow the guiding principles of the Grow Green environmental master plan and not just do assessments that allow the developers with deep pockets to decide when our green spaces disappear. With the potential loss of the golf course to more housing, where is the balance, accountability, and environmental stewardship that the city has proposed in the environmental master plan? We'd like, thank you. We'd like to thank all the delegates for coming this morning. Can I have a motion to receive the de Mr. Clerk. Through you, Mr. Chair. There is delegation listed number three, Castlemore Residence Group, 2585426 Ontario. There are a number of individuals listed here, but I, I, I'm not sure if there's representatives speaking on behalf of all of those. So each one will, will, will uh, want to make a statement, some brief. Please proceed, sir. So the press can just line up the ones that want to speak that are listed. Thank you. Uh, Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and uh, fellow councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you again. Um, so this is a follow-up to the December 4th meeting where um, we discussed the same topic um, in terms of the, your, your review of, um, of you know, potentially um, selling these two, two parcels. Um, what I want to stress and what you've heard already is that selling these two lots is not an administrative, uh, isolated decision, right? This is tied to these infill development that's been uh, fought now for the last three years. It's got uh, legal uh, implications in terms of um, the LPAT hearing that took place with the developer. So I want to make sure all the councils understand this is not just, you know, rubber stamping uh, a recommendation from staff that we've got two parcels that have no impact to the community. They have an, an urgent impact to our community. So I want to make sure you understand that. Um, the, the focus, just to give you a little bit of historical perspective, um, when the golf course was reduced from 18 holes to nine holes back in 2009, it went to the OMB. There was a negotiated settlement to allow that development to, to proceed. Uh, the conditions of that were that the parcels of land that you see behind you were rezoned from residential to commercial recreational. And the two parcels of land that are, are the, the agenda items today were gifted to the city. And, and those were done specifically, right? working with the city and working with the previous owner, that there would be no further development on these parcels of land ever. There would be green space for the community. So we understood that a nine-hall golf course might not survive, right? But the focus was that the green space would survive. So I want to make sure that um, all of you sort of, you know, understand that. The owner, the, the current owner of, of the, the land, purchased the land understanding the zoning designation and understanding the city um, owned those parcels of land. They decided to not meet with the residents at all. They decided to bypass all of the city processes and went directly to Alpat. So their focus was, it's our land, we can do whatever we want without the city's involvement, without the residents' involvement, and that's a disgrace. We've been at this now for 19 years, trying to enjoy our homes, enjoy our families, and this can't be the final nail in the coffin of all these residents. And, and so they went and, and basically presented a plan. So the resident group, which, which represent 400 people, right, spent a ton of money, over $80,000, to be there at LPAC, to take nine days of vacation, to attend the meeting every day, okay, so that, that we can fight this thing. They had the gall to present a plan to, to the LPAC that showed in their plan, the only access points into the development would be through those two parcels of land that they did not own. Can you imagine that? They presented that and basically said, here's the development, right? So, so in the end, with whatever happened, they were, they were sort of approved. So they, they got a plan that they can't implement because they don't own the land. So can you imagine the goal of these developers, right? With, with the fact that says we're gonna ignore, right? What the city wants or what the city, you know, lands owned or what the residents want, we're going to present a plan that they can't, can't implement. So right now, they can't implement the plan that got approved because of those two lots that they don't own. So we don't want you to sell those lots to them. Because if we do that, the residents lose the voice, the city loses the voice, and we have no strategic leverage with this developer. 
okay? What they have to do is they can't, they can't implement this plan, so they would have to go back to LPAT. They would have to file a new plan, which says that the city can re-engage, the residents can re-engage, and we have an opportunity to, to make what's best for, for the residents and the community here um, going forward. So again, this is a strategic decision, not an administrative one, right? So the focus is why sell them the lots, right, when in fact they can't implement their plan as, as outlined. They have to go back and follow the LPAT process again. So as we refer back to the December 4th decision that came out, the decision from um, the chair and the, and the councillors was that the decision was deferred. And, the decision, and, and talking to the councillors, uh, sorry, to the legal um, individuals after the meeting, they said that the decision was made to allow the city of Brampton to re-engage with the developer to try and find a solution that met the residents' requirements. I don't believe anything has been done between the December 4th meeting and December and, and the current meeting today. So I'm not sure what new developments have taken place that says that the decision that was made back on December 4th and the rationale for it is any different today in the context of whatever discussions have taken place with the developer. Um, finally, um, this has been, as you've heard from a number of residents, I can't tell you how frustrating it's been. Um, I was the first homeowner. I live at 19 Tree Line, um, and uh, I've been involved with it all the way through. I can't tell you the stress that's, that's involved. That says you're buying a property, you're building it into a community, that you're looking for, um, you know, your retirement years and to enjoy the health and benefits of, of green space, and all that has been taken away over the years through lies, deceits. Um, previous councils didn't stand with the residents. I know a number of you that, that, that you know, are, are, have been on the councils before were very supportive um, of what was uh, being done in terms of helping the residents. So we're looking for this council uh, to stand up and basically help the residents. Uh, this is not right. It was never right. And the focus that says that we're going to arbitrarily sell these lots and allow, and allow the, the developer who has not worked with the city, who has not worked with residents, at least I can say in previous developments, at least there was consultation, there was some discussion, there was some, some negotiations, some give and take on what represented good planning versus, versus planning that didn't meet the residents' requirements. This developer has chosen to basically bypass all the city engagement, all the resident engagement, thinking that they can, they can force this decision and do whatever they want with the land and destroy our community. Please don't let that happen. We need your leadership. We need your, your support. Don't let this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We invite our next delegate. Please give us your name. Uh, it's Steve Kirby. Thank Peter, you, Mr. Kirby. Yes. Peter, could you pull up the, uh, the diagrams I sent over, please? So I have um, three diagrams for us, um, diagram one, two, and three that I'll be referring to. Uh, just to give us um, kind of a, an idea of where these lands are located and maybe some potential different uses for the lands. We've heard how frustrated the residents are. Um, I think that's pretty clear. And uh, we've heard about the green, uh, the Greco Green Park, so I'd just like to address that a bit. Uh, my name is Stephen Kirby, and I live at 42 Tree Line Boulevard, where we have resided for 18 years. Um, we've also been involved in this since day one, and it has been very frustrating for our family. We were opposed to the sale of these surplus blocks because unwanted development would occur. There needs to be public consultation and consideration for using these lands as part of the Echo Green Park network, identified in the Council Approve Brampton 2040 vision. Uh, we are opposed to this infill development and the sale of the city-owned lots that would permit it for the following reasons. Although the golf course uh, no longer exists, the remaining green spaces on parcels B and C are the centerpiece of our community. There is a sense of great pride and it all works because this was the design residents brought into. And I think you heard uh, from some of the other speakers so far that uh, it's quite true. Um, these lands are our only green space in our media area and they, would, and they should be added to the proposed citywide park network. They can be added to the other lands adjacent to the West Humber River this specific Green Park network extends from Caledon to Clareville Conservation Area along the West Humber River Corridor. And uh, this was one of the things that, um, that um, uh, Rosemary from Sierra was referring to. What I'd like to do is just bring up uh, diagram one for a moment. I don't know if I can find my laser pointer. I'll point over here. 
So basically, where we are is, is uh, let me see here, can I see better there? Yeah, okay, so there's my, uh, sorry. Uh, we're up here, and you can see the little blue dot from the Google map. Actually, this doesn't work very well here, but let's see, there's, there's a little dot, the Google map. And if you follow behind the land that you see here, which is some of the lands that we're talking about, you'll see the West Humber River, and it kind of snakes all the way down to this green space down here. Well, that's actually the Clareville Conservation Area. So what Rosemary has been proposing and that I'm going to second is, is that we start looking at these lands as part of this green park, and specifically it's what they call a city park, okay? And that the city park would allow access to the larger um, already planned um, citywide network. And why is this important? I'll show you in a second. So if you look at that snaking down, if we can go to diagram number two, okay? This is actually from the, um, from the 2040 vision, which I imagine all the councillors still support today. I, I know it was passed with some previous councillors. But uh, if we look here, we're, we're over by what is over here called Brand East, which is over here in the far right-hand corner. Um, and if we look, Peter, if you don't mind, Airport Road, and you go north to Countryside, which is just uh, here, hold on, right there. Sorry, guys. My pointer's not working that great here. It doesn't actually point there. See, there's Airport Road here. So if we go up Airport Road uh, towards the town of Caledon, we'll see that there's actually um, a winding area. And that winding area, I don't know if I can go and get it, my pointer to work. I should have tested this. This is always applicable, right? Um, this is a lot of screens are not going to so basically, there is an area that comes snaking down into the Clareville Conservation Area, and that's the West Humber. And if we go to diagram three, it's a little bit clearer, because it's a, just an expansion of it. Yeah, so there's the expansion. We see Brampton East, we see the, in the top town of Caledon, and then right underneath it, there, you're right there, if you follow that down, that is actually the West Humber River. And the lands that we're talking about are really, they abut right onto that. So they're actually adjacent to it. And one of the things in the green plan is, is that you're supposed to be looking and protecting lands that abut upon other ones because continuous land for big parks is important. Okay, So having a bunch of little parks all over the place doesn't make a lot of sense. What you want to have is bigger parks, which is part of the actual uh, vision. So we feel that the two city-owned lots should be accessed to the citywide park. The two parcels in question will be better served to address the lack of park green space in our neighborhood as local parks or community parks, as you refer to them as, that are adjacent to the citywide park rather than adding an additional 60 to 70 homes, which you've heard from all of the other speakers so far is unacceptable in our minds. Um, we are also very concerned for the environment and the associated green space that we have in our area. We understand that studies show it is a critical planning concern for the Brampton residents. And I refer you to the uh, 2040 vision for that. Um, and after all, if we, what future will we have if we can't breathe the air, drink the water, or have accessible green space in our area? The Castlemore Golf Course lands provide a unique opportunity to correct the existing situation. Uh, as such, I would like to propose that the city purchase these two parcels, which are called B and C, and designate them as a community heritage park. Indigenous plants can be reseeded as per recommendations from the uh, TRCA. The animal life will continue to use these lands as a corridor and flourish. Upon consultation with the city and TRCA, we can put bike and walking paths that can be constructed. The bike and walking paths can be created for both public enjoyment, but also to serve as alternate transportation, which by the way is part of the 2040 vision as well. These trails would meet with the existing Toronto, City of Toronto trails at the Clareville Conservation Area, providing a cycling throughway into Toronto. So basically, guys, this boils down to a simple choice for council. A vote to sell the lots will allow a greedy builder that has ignored us all totally at every opportunity, did not follow a proper transparent process, planning process, and is locking us out of the planning of our community entirely to build a development we don't want. Or a vote against this will allow time to integrate these lands with the citywide green park network and or force the builder to provide an alternate plan that res residents may agree with. I implore you, please don't be afraid to take a stand. Death by a thousand cuts that is slowly removing all the green spaces in our Castlemore community is not an isolated incident. Developers use this as a tool against us all the time. And if the 2040 vision is to be achieved, we need to look at communities holistically, not one parcel at a time. 
Otherwise, this strategy will leave us with un the unsustainable, unhealthy communities that we live in today. And I would like to point out, too, that um, the City of Brampton did undertake some uh, neighborhood audits. And um, the closest one to us is the Gore Meadows one. And if you read this audit report, it fails miserably. Okay, the sustainability of this area fails miserably. It is not a walkable environment. We've also engaged an environmental planner who put together a walkability uh, tool for us, and the preliminary results that I got back are shockingly bad. Okay, so this is an issue you guys need to deal with. It's the urban sprawl, and if we can use these lands as an alternate use, I think that this would start a, a trend that you could also use in your own uh, regions. Okay, because it's not just here it's going to be in your backyard too. And you'll have to deal with your residents shortly. So finally, we hope that the city will continue to recognize this planned development will be detrimental to the existing residents, the natural heritage features of our area, and not surplus the blocks so the builder can buy them. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions? Thank you. We will be saving okay. questions for thank the you. end. Welcome. Just give us your name. For I am know. Karen McDonald, and I'm sorry, I'm going to get a little emotional because this has been going on for so long for all of us. Councillor Dillon, it's very nice to see you again. It's been a long time. Um, I've spent a lot of time over the last few days trying to figure out what to talk to you folks about. This is my second time being here in the five years I've been a resident of Brampton. Uh, last time I was here, you know, I've got all these notes, but I think I'm just going to talk from the heart. Um, Alan, it's good to see you again as well. Um, I was five months pregnant the last time I was here. You know, we had just bought our house. We, uh, we lived just off the map. I'm right beside the golf, the golf trail there. And uh, my husband and I moved up from Mississauga. We lived in a community close to um, the Hershey Center area. I think they've renamed it the Ice Rink now. And I could walk my dog, and there's a leash-free dog park. I could put on rollerblades at my front desk, you know, my front step, and like shortly go down my street, and I was right up trails everywhere. I could ride my bike. I could do everything. When I moved here, it was unbelievable because it isn't your typical suburban sprawl. There's, I have one neighbor, great guy, you know, best friends, and nobody else around me. And that's a really neat feeling when, you know, you work hard. And we're, we're a young family. You know, I have a two-year-old. Uh, like I said, I was five months pregnant last time I was here. And, uh, you know, he loves watching the ducks. You know, we have that pond right there, and he loves watching the ducks. And we put a bird feeder out, even though the land's not ours. And, you know, we have a little bird feeder there every year, and we watch the ducks and everything. And we've now found ourselves, since I've been fighting this, the, the first time I spoke with Alan was in 2015. There's a bunch of people in the back and they were drilling in the middle of the day and I was on mat leave and they're in the middle of the day and they're, they're, they're drilling and there's all these random blue boxes now all over the place. We don't know anything. I mean, I get flyers on my front door every day, but I can't be told what's going on in my backyard. So I write a letter to the city and Alan nicely responds and tells me that the developer has been approved to develop parcel A, but that's not enough for him. He wants B and C too. So that's going to infill our two neighborhoods right there. So that's 2015. I find that out. So then, you know, things are kind of quiet for a while. I think we come here, I think the city holds a, a, a meeting. We all meet, you know, in one of the community centers. And there was tons of residents that came out. And, and you know, we spoke with city planning. And Jessica Kwan was there. She's now long gone. And, uh, you know, it felt like, like there was, the city was listening, we were listening. And then it was just silence. It was just quiet. And we're like, hmm, maybe nothing's going to happen. Fast forward to Christmas Eve. And all of a sudden, they're clear. They're cutting trees. They're cutting trees everywhere. We're on, we're on the phone with each other. We're on the phone with the city. We're like, what's going on? They're just cutting trees. Like, we haven't been told that they've been approved to do this. We're then told by the city, well, they just cut down a couple of dead trees. Okay, no problem. Fast forward to this year. I'm sitting at home with my little guy, December 23rd. And all of a sudden, this giant excavator just comes rolling through my backyard. And they're not even nicely cutting down trees, guys. They're running them over. They're smashing them. I'm on the phone with the city, trying to reach anybody that will listen. But it's December 23rd. It's the holidays. Once again, they're out there. Right? They haven't touched the land. They cut it twice in a summer. And they're out there. Two Christmases cutting down our trees. So I'm on the phone with the city. And I'm on hold. And I'm trying to find anybody that can tell me what's happening. Do they have permits? Because once they're gone, they're gone. They're 100-year-old trees. And they're gone, guys. They're gone. There's not a tree back there. I can see every neighbor. I have no privacy. So regardless of what decisions are made here, there's already damage done. There's big damage done to our neighborhood. But we can stop it. If we don't sell those two key parcels, they can't develop how they want to. We can find a compromise. There has to be one. There has to be one between the city and the residents and the builder. There has to be some way that we all can be content you know, I want a golf course, but that's not going to happen. I bought a house that backs onto a golf course. 
It's not going to come back. He tore down the clubhouse in the middle of the night without anybody even knowing. Like, this is what this developer is doing. To, to you know, my neighbor's points, he doesn't want to work with us. But I think the city does. You know, and I'm, I'm upset that the Mayor Brown isn't here, to be honest. You know, I voted for him. And we've spoken with him. And I'd like, I'd like, his, I'd like him to hear us. You know, Councillor Dillon's been, been siding with us for years. And, and he's aware. And he's, you know, he knows our neighbourhood, obviously, very well. So I implore you, we need your help. I apologize for getting emotional. It's, it's my home. You know, it's where, like I said, my husband and I have worked really hard. I mean, imagine that. I'm 40 and I own that house. Like, you know how hard we had to work to own that house? And now it's just being, it's just being demolished. We're, we will move. You know, we've, to Christine's point, we've put renovations on hold. We're not going to bother renovating certain aspects of our house anymore. We're just going to sell it. Because I will move. Right now I can't sell my house. There's no trees. It's obviously getting prepped for development. Um, I'm going to lose 100 grand right now if I try to sell it. So I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait to see what you folks choose. And, you know, hopefully I get to stay. So thank you, guys. I appreciate your time very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Sikon. Uh I'm the owner of 46 Hilson Court, which is on the west side of Block 99. Uh, so you've heard expressions from uh, Jason and family that they've expressed interest to buy uh, that lot. Um, I've spoken at council here in the past, uh, made the comment, same thing. I've received the same letter. I did express interest in buying that lot. I asked for city council to provide the rules on selling that lot, what the hierarchy is, et cetera. Never received any information back. I've actually sent the letter that I received from the city to the city council. Uh, through our uh, resident council, so to make sure it's on file. Uh, so if it's revenue that the city is looking for, we've already expressed interest in buying that parcel of land. So you just heard, uh, you know, residents putting their life on hold. Um, we did the same thing. We've been looking for upgrades and planning uh, investment in the property, uh, building our basement, doing upgrades for five, six years. Um, when those trees got knocked down, that was the last straw. We put ourselves up for sale. We've had several viewings. One of the first questions that gets asked is, what's happening with the back? The offers that we've had. We have exact near houses on two sides of the street. We're getting offers on the house based on the property sale across the street that didn't pay a lot premium, that didn't have the, the, the green space view. So it has financial implications. So I would just like to say that I'm putting the city on notice because the city had culpability in this when those lots were sold as, as green course, uh, as, as golf course houses. Um, and by the actions or lack of action, it has financial implications for the residents. So we have you know, competing offers, et cetera. We have a, a set of facts that we can present. Um, so I'm just uh, laying this out today at city council. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We would like to thank everyone for your delegations. I have a motion from Councillor Dillon to receive all of the delegations. All in favor? Carried? Okay. So we're now going to move, uh, we're going to bring forward item 10.2.1. Do any members have any questions or comments? Councillor Dillon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> I just want to thank all the delegates uh, for, for coming in today and, uh, um, you know, they've spent uh, quite a few years um, on this issue and, uh, and I commend them for their hard work. I, I don't think I've seen more uh, organized uh, group of residents. So I just want to say thanks for all your efforts. Um, um, you know, there is significance to this area. It was one of the first, if not the first uh, area designed uh, for the first executive area in Brampton. Um, I don't directly live in that specific section. I live within the tree line area, just a few hundred meters down. So I'm very, uh, you know, um, aware of, of what is going on. I have a chance to drive uh, through Donwood's area. I've walked through the area a number of times, probably a thousand times through some of the parks and the trails there. It's a very beautiful area. Um, and so I do recall when uh, the area was being built 
uh, about 20 years ago, I was still in uh, university, and we, you know, it was our dream, our family's dream, uh, to move here. And so, uh, even when it was farmland, uh, we'd come and we'd see and envision our house. And when, you know, the first stubs, um, when the house first started getting built, we'd come pretty much two, three times a week to see it. And so, uh, it was our, our family's entire investment. And uh, uh, I can only imagine what it feels like for, for these residents, uh, you know, for their entire investment to be uh, disturbed in this way. And so, um, just some, uh, I just have a couple questions for staff. Um, if, if the city were not to sell these two stubs, can Flintshire still develop? Uh, through the chair. Uh, the developer currently has an application before the ALPAT to have their approved plan uh, modified to permit development through um, access points which they own. So there are, there are parcels of land adjacent to uh, the roadways in the area that are owned by the developer and they have uh, modified their plan to propose access through their, their own um, lands which would permit development of those parcels. Right. So uh, I just, I guess by head nods, I'm looking at uh, some of the residents there. Um, did you know that even if we don't sell these stubs to them, that they can still develop? Just just, just need a head nod. We, you can come back after, uh, Frank. Did you guys know that or no? You guys knew that, right? Um, it, and so they can still develop. And so if the city to, were to not sell it, uh, to them, uh, how does it uh, affect the city at all? Through the chair, yeah, if the city were not to sell the road stubs, the developer would proceed with its request to the LPAT to have the alternate plan of subdivision approved. Mm -hmm. And if it were approved, um, access would be through uh, differing, different points right. um, than, than the access points that we see there, which were uh, road stubs which were taken by the city uh, many years ago, right. um, and were intended to be used for the purpose of access to those lots. So those right. those were the the preferred access points that the city had identified uh, many years ago. Right, and so uh, you know I'm aware of the history. I think Intracorp was the original developer on this side, and then Madame was on the other side, phase two. Um, and I remember as a you know in my early 20s emailing the city and. Uh, uh, asking what these stubs were for, and they said they were on sale, nobody wanted to buy them, and so uh, I, in the infrastructure is already there um, underneath, uh, and so, which is why some of the residents have feel like they've been let on. Uh, they were given a letter, uh, I think in 2006, stating that nothing was happening, uh, you know, that uh, gave them some satisfaction at the time, uh, but I guess they've been living a little bit uh, nervous for the past number of years, not knowing what's exactly going to happen, and so um, they paid the uh, extra cost to have uh, a premium lot. Um, you know, they've uh, invested their entire life uh, into their house, and uh, many of the people I see walking on a, on a daily basis as well uh, down tree line, and, and it does take 15 minutes to get to uh, uh, the, the nearest park, and so um, just for today, I won't support it. I don't think I can support um, you know, selling the lands just because um, they can still develop. There's really no technical challenge for them as well. And what we can do is uh, look at ways to utilize these two uh, uh, two stubs to, to better serve the community, whether they're parquettes uh, or whether they're something else. I think, and I encourage uh, council as well uh, to really take that into account. Uh, these uh, residents have worked for years uh, on this issue. Um, and, and I think by not selling it, if they still have a plan, uh, Flintshire, then they can go ahead with that, uh, through that process. Uh, but at the same time, what we can do is we can provide the residents something uh, very useful uh, for this c uh, community. And so there's a beautiful tree uh, on the Donwood stub, uh, absolutely beautiful. It, uh, uh, I've seen, uh, I've driven by it a number of times, 
Uh, I've seen people, you know, standing near it, under it, provides good shade, and uh, I believe it's decades old, if not a hundred years old, as I heard as well. And so, um, you know, I, I won't support uh, the, the recommendation today. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Medeiros. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, through the chair. Um, because the staff, so we've heard consistently that uh, the residents, uh, some residents have showed interest in purchasing the land. Um, and again, I'm not sure if this is an in-camera discussion, uh, but um, they said that the city stopped communication. Um, if we were to declare them surplus, uh, and I, I know the answer already, but I'll just ask you, um, is there not a way that we can uh, give them first bids or sell directly uh, to them? To the chair, I believe that the question is probably more appropriately directed to Realty, but my understanding is that um, the process would be a public process and anyone could bid on it. So the residents would be able to bid on the purchase of those land stocks. Okay, but when, and through the chair, um, when we hear that they were offered it, they showed interest, and after there was a stop in communication, um, I know we received that information, and I know it's a, um, so at, at, we can't go back to that process by declaring it surplus. So if we maintain the land, can we seek that process, which was, I guess, followed through years ago? To the chair. Um, what we are proposing here is actually a reinitiation of that same process. You are you are declaring it surplus again, so that it can go through the process of sale. And, and but through the chair again, it would have to be highest bidder. It, Realty has um, a various factors that they consider, is my understanding, um, in assessing uh, offers, and that is one of the factors that they consider the price that is offered. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maderos. Councillor Dillon, do you have a motion that you'd like to put on the floor? Uh, Councillor Singh. Yeah, um, I just, uh, obviously this is, uh, has been a long journey and there's been many costs in this journey, not just financial, emotional, mental, taking time out. Um, so, uh, you know, I've had opportunity to learn the history of this. Uh, I know Councillor Dillon, even um, before I came to Council, uh, continuously kept me updated on this, as this was very important to him, and uh, I've had an opportunity <coughs> to speak to the residents, and uh, I will also be uh, supporting Councillor Dillon and the residents on this. I did want to clarify that, uh, just for uh, the public, is um, that the mayor has actually uh, had a trip confirmed uh, for uh, FDI and it was a conference and, and it's important to also have somebody uh, trying to attract business. So I just want to clarify for that record that uh, it's not just today. Uh, this was uh, booked uh, many months ago and uh, you know, it's, there's no intention to skip a meeting. I just want to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dillon? Um, just because of the, uh, the importance of this issue um, through, to you, Mr. Chair, I was wondering if we can have a, a short recess just to uh, we had some questions for, for legal as well, Councillor Singh and I, before we go to, to a vote. Do members of council committee uh, wish to have a recess? We have a motion to recess. All of, we have another question. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Sorry, I just, I just want to confirm with <coughs> Councillor Dillon and Councillor Singh, is the information that you're going to be requesting from uh, legal and real estate pertinent to the rest of us? Should we be going in camera or is this... It is, it's involved, sorry, through you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, it's in regards to some, to clarification on some um, uh, perhaps in-camera matter. We just want to clarify with them first. Yeah, we'll go to in-camera as well. Okay, so we'll be going in-camera to hear the prior I don't, I don't know. If, if, if they deem that we need to, then... So I would uh, suggest that we take a short five-minute recess. Yeah. Ten-minute recess. So we need a 10 minute recess. All in favor? <coughs> Carries. We're in recess. We have enough. Welcome back, everyone. When we uh, call the recess, we were discussing item 10.2.1.
I have Councillor Dillon on the board. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so um, the um, the report and the recommendations are, are on the uh, screen, and um, uh, I'd like to move that uh, uh, we strike out number two and three, uh, and that we just uh, receive the report. So, Mr. Kirk, we're hearing that we're striking out uh, clause two and three and moving clause number one. S Sorry. Mr. D Councilor Dillon? Um, I I'm not sure if uh, this be is required um, in this, um, to add this, um, but um, uh, I'd like to perhaps even staff respond that if we were to strike out two and three, uh, we would look at ways to utilize the uh, those two stubs for community purposes and whether it's a community park, a community garden, uh, that we work with the, the local uh, residents of the area um, to find out how we could best uh, uh, use these to serve uh, them. Thank you, Councillor. Do staff have any comments on that? So through I you, Mr. Chair, just if, if Councillor Dillon's motion is just to receive the report, which is recommendation one, then the proper, the two road stubs still remain in the municipality's custody and control and ownership, and they can decide what it does with it as it sees fit. Sorry, sorry, could you repeat that, please? If, if just your recommendation carries, which is just recommendation one to receive the report, mm -hmm. and then the, those two road stubs still ma are maintained in the ownership of the municipality, mm -hmm. and the city can decide how it wishes to use those properties. Uh, should we uh, add wording through you, Mr. Chair, to the clerk? Uh, um, uh, I'd like to commence the process uh, of speaking to residents, so, so if that could be added uh, on what, how this, these plots could be used to, to best uh, serve the residents uh, and uh, look at a number of different uh, uh, things such as a you know a park a community garden uh, or whatever it may be and so I think that wording might be important to, to have in uh, the motion itself so we have a suggested amendment mr. chair it would be it's effectively a, a main motion moved by Councillor Dillon as shown on the screen one is to receive the report and second is staff be requested to investigate through consultation with residents of the properties, ways the parcels could be best utilized for potential park-like purposes. Yes. Members of Council, you have the motion before you. We're speaking to the motion. Council Boom. Thank you very much through you, Mr. Chair. Just a clarification through the clerk. We're receiving a report that deems this land surplus, and then we're asking staff to investigate ways that we can use the property that is already deemed surplus. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, no, it is not. So uh, staff recommendations two and three were to take the positive actions to, to declare the land surplus and then pr proceed presumably to dispose of those properties. Uh, Councillor Dillon's motion is just to receive the report as, as information and to ask staff to investigate through consultation with the residents ways to utilize um, those two road stubs as, as still as municipal properties for park-like purposes. So it's not declaring land surplus at this time okay I'm just I, the reason I'm asking is because I'm reading here where the previous report uh, Ward 10 declared surplus in 2007 remains surplus so th through you mr. chair that's just the title of the report uh, to affirm the surplus declaration um, and that does not in any way um, compel if this council Dillon's motion carries that the city is declaring those land surplus. They were declared surplus, I believe, in 2007. Um, with the passage of time and circumstances, it was deemed um, appropriate to reaffirm, and council can choose to not declare those, reaffirm declaring those land surplus. So this is a proper motion, Councillor Dillon's motion. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Councillor Pleshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, are there services under the either of the two lots that the um, developer needs to develop the two parcels of property? Uh, through the chair, I believe there, there's a storm sewer and perhaps even a sanitary and water main uh, connections that are uh, within the block right now. Okay, and um, so we, we're not able to, to limit their ability to connect to those, are we? 
No, they, they would have to look at a, another avenue. And can the province force us to sell the pieces of property? I'm not aware of, uh, perhaps maybe our legal counsel could. Does the chair know that the road stubs belong to the city and it's up to the city to decide what it wishes to do with it and, and, and that was the purpose of this report? But can the province uh, force us to sell the pieces of property? To the chair, no. Can they expropriate the property from the city? We're talking about the province. It's a rhetorical question. Yes, they can. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Plessy. Members of Council, you have the uh, revised motion before you to receive the report and that staff be directed to investigate through consultation with local area residents of the area ways that the parcels can be best utilized for potential park-like purposes. All in favor? That carries. Thank you. May I also have a motion to receive item number 10.4.2, correspondence from residents. From Councillor Singh, all in favor? That carries. Members of Council, we now have a delegation from Sharon Vandrish, the president of Branton Music Theatre, with regards to item 7.2.2, an arm's length organization for the arts, culture, and creative industry development in the city of Brampton. And this relates to your item 7.2.2. Ms. Vandrish, welcome. Good morning. Everyone. But just before, Ms. Spanish, before you begin, let's just uh, give a minute or two for some of the residents to leave council Thank chambers. You. Talk about clearing the room. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sharon Vandris. As some of you know, I'm the president of Brampton Music Theatre, where I also act as uh, resident musical director. I'm also the interim chair of the Brampton Arts Coalition Committee. As you know, we're an ad hoc group formed almost two years ago, made up of many Brampton arts leaders, both legacy and newly formed in support of the arts in Brampton. Our organization currently represents 18 groups. We're very excited to see the plans for an arm length organization underway and commend the Economic uh, Development and Culture Department for spearheading this effort. Almost a year ago, we came to Council to ask for support of this initiative and we are encouraged to see the arts becoming a priority in our city. So rest assured, I want to be very clear, we support the plan. Um, the reality, however, it's taken us almost a year to see a recommendation and while we support the plan moving forward, we are concerned at the forecast at which the team needs to get this plan underway. As mentioned a year ago, the previous Arts Council was a vibrant organization with membership in excess of 50, some of which are now part of the group of 18. Um, where we're challenged is the understanding that how long it took us to get, um, sorry, with our understanding is how long it took us only a few months to disband an organization that existed for 40 years, but it'll take us five years to create that same organization with some level of independence from oversight. Wikipedia defines an arts council as a government or nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting the arts mainly by funding local artists, awarding prizes, and organizing arts events. They often operate at arm's length from a government to prevent political interference in their decision. That description is taken from Wikipedia. The longer the organization isn't independent, the longer the probability that interference could occur. Our second concern is the, lack, is the lack of apparent and obvious input from arts leaders and artists in any proposed panel and or guidance. Many of our organizations and even those not partaking in the BACC represent decades of experience and in a plethora of artistic endeavors, which are extremely valuable to the mosaic which is to make up the future of any arm's length organization. 
We fail to see where this valuable and extremely important merit is added to the mix of the future of the plans for the arm's length model. The previous Arts Council was spawned by arts leaders in our community. The same people who stand here often and regularly and those who make you proud of your city are those you should empower to participate in these initiatives. Together, we are stronger. Last Friday, I had the pleasure of watching the jazz mechanics perform at the Rex, a very prominent jazz club in Toronto, representing Brampton to one of Canada's biggest jazz legends, Phil Nimmons. He came to hear the mechanics play his music, Playing for Phil Nimmons, as Andrew Jones, our musical director, put it so eloquently Friday night, is like playing hockey for Wayne Gretzky. And David is someone who supported the arts in our city for 30 years. J.L. Richardson, who has brought a vibrant and powerful literary festival to our city and who has put Brampton in an international literary stage. Or Carmen Spada, who sparked and driven a jazz festival year over year to ignite passion for jazz all over town where none existed before. Denise Fournier, who's led the Rose Orchestra to a new leadership and vibrant patronage after a collapse of the Brampton Symphony Orchestra. Regan Hayward, who has not, not only been part of the previous Arts Council and has valuable knowledge of the purpose and successes and failures of such an organization, but also is a driving force of visual arts and has grown our organ sorry, and in our fair city and has kept Beaux Arts Brampton alive in spite of many challenges, or even uh, myself, who has grown our organization to 90% attendances of eight performances at our latest production of Mamma Mia at the Rose. That's 90% of 840 seats of eight solid performances. These are just some examples of our successes. For all of us though, we've also known failure and with that comes knowledge that is valuable to impart on any go forward plan. These are just some examples of many of the groups and the knowledges that they have. Where are the artists and the arts leaders included in the plan for the future of the arm's length organization? We would really like to see that in the plan. In short, and I'm not sure how this process works, but we would like to recommend that this report be revised or modified to include a shorter timeline to independence and the panel be modified to include greater inclusion of grassroots leaders as part of its makeup. Don't get me wrong, Happy to see the dollars there. We're, we're really, really looking forward to seeing it uh, come into fruition. We just need it to happen sooner. We, we're, we're concerned about groups that are not going to make it to the end zone. Um, so we just need your help in making sure it happens faster. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Vanderish. I have speakers on my board. Councillor Medeiros. Uh, thank you. Through the chair. Yeah, you can come back to me. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much again. I, I know your long history and passion uh, um, for your leadership uh, in the arts community. I guess just a question to you, a couple of questions. Um, and I'd like to hear your feedback because uh, what we heard about this arm's length agency, but once up, what ends up happening in practicality and what happened with the last arts agency when there are decisions or infighting or some form of situation that arises, it comes back on our lap again. And then we're asked to engage and get involved. And then, um, you know, similar to what happens at council, uh, you know, there becomes, uh, I guess, those who are the favorites and those who are not. Um, so um, I guess this is one of those reluctance that, you know, we see that with the grants program, that we said, okay, don't involve uh, political interference, but yet you have all these groups come to us after feel that they've been unfairly uh, uh, dealt with and then after there's no accountability because you're mad with me but I had nothing to do with the grants process and the same thing with the arts so that, that, that is one thing and I, I'd like to hear sort of your feedback the second aspect in terms of um, involving more grassroots or, or more local um, the issue that always comes up with the arts is that you know you have more sophistication in one area so yourselves folks who are a lot more sophisticated understand arts in, in one concept but then after in all the ethnocultural groups there's all these arts going on that is not so sophisticated and organized yet they're not engaged and and then after there's certain sectors you know I've heard from you know musicians or other who they have a profession or they have an expertise in a certain art that is not reflected on the board or on this agency 
then you know their fear is that then there is no recognition of what they do through this agency and then we become this again having to manage so that's that's always a dilemma you know and, and i do believe um you know this, this is a good idea but i'm always hesitant when we lose control because ultimately i'm accountable to you if i control the situation when i don't control it then don't come you know to me but then after i'm asked to engage and get involved in it so do you see what i'm struggling with right um that was a lot yeah uh, i'm sorry sorry you know, if I could go back to the first one, I think I certainly think there needs a period of time where we have to work together. Um, I think there needs to be some criteria matrix in which we're going to have to determine what um, criteria would be in order to award grants. So I think those are things that we all have to agree on to begin with, if, if we're talking about grants, for example, because yeah, yeah. that's going to be one there. We're, we're all going to have to agree that it's not going to be a we or they. And if I'm not, if I recall correctly, and Reagan, you might be able to help me. Um, I believe there still it has to be a liaison. There still has to be points of contact where someone is uh, having input and going back and forth. But that criteria and all of the preset determination has to be done collaboratively. I don't think that it, when I say independence, I don't mean that yeah. we're going to be off here and you're going to be there. There still has to be many points of contact um, and the framework still has to be set up that is filtered back and forth. I'm not talking about complete independence. I, I think it has to be all that collaboration has to happen and that we all have to agree on what those, those terms are. There has to be criteria. But I just think getting there, getting to that point, I think we're just struggling in understanding how with so many models out there, and, and you know, it's not rocket science. At least we don't believe it's rocket science. The, you know, the challenge to getting there in so long. So, a, a shorter timeline, but with still collaboration. So we're not proposing walking out the door in three months from now. You know, but the models are there. We just think we can work together in a shorter timeline. We, the collective we, and um, and we, we can agree on that, so that you can say we all agreed, council agreed, you know, the arts community agreed. And this is what we determined was fair and equal. And, and maybe that's revisited on a regular basis. Maybe it's every six months, maybe it's yeah. once a year, or maybe it's once every two years. But if there are complaints, it's, there's that review process and we look at it again and then we determine this is a new criteria. So it's not set once and then it's released. <laughs> maybe it's a review and we can decide what that term can be. So that was one and then it's never set in stone forever. I still think, I think it was Sandra Haynes, if I'm not mistaken, that was the liaison. There's always that liaison. Yeah, there will be a council. Right? So, and there's still an accountability to the councils. It, that still, I believe, has to be there. Um, and that there always has to be a review. I don't think it's completely independent forever. Um, and I still think there has to be some phasing in, but I, for us, just five years uh, was, was difficult to, understand Did it, and well, there yeah, was no, a second no, part and there's more there's no right or wrong it's just I wanted to hear your thoughts someone who uh, who has had so much experience in the community I know we've talking offline we I know about some of your frustrations before yeah um, it's just and, and I agree that that there was some some challenges to the previous yeah. Arts Council I didn't believe it was uh, at, at the end of it I didn't believe it was functioning as well as it could have to be kind, yeah. um, so I definitely think that it, that we needed a new a new look at things. So now is our great opportunity to look again at if you could start over doing. How would you do it now? So I th I think it's all great. Um, I just I'm concerned that so we went from 50 to 18 and plus the peripheral groups that are not part of that. What happens if we're two, three, four years? What's going to happen to some of them that are circling the drain, the drain now, which we've talked about? We've, we've brought forward some groups that are struggling that need emergency funding. That's out there right now. Uh, another year or two without, you know, I, I just, I'm very concerned. And I'm, it's not that I, we're one of the groups, although, you know, it's iffy sometimes. Um, we just, we, I'm, we're just very concerned for everyone. So, Thank yeah. Thank you. I have Councillor Bowman, but I believe Councillor Bowman, you wish, you wish to speak specifically to the report? Correct. So I need a motion to receive the delegation from Councillor Medeiros. All in favor? That carries. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bowman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I know Kelly and Victoria, I don't think Kelly's mobile. She's mobile. Kelly, <laughs> Somebody wheel it out on a doll. Okay. Actually, I was 
Sorry, I guess you're not going to ski day. <laughs> anyway. Registered for ski day. Yeah. Um, I just would like you to address some of the concerns that, that um, Sharon had mentioned about not having um, input from artists and, and local performers here in the process going forward. Sure, happy to. So through the chair, thank you for the opportunity to speak and to um, build on what Sharon has brought forward. I think that we're all on the same page and excited about the opportunity for the new development agency. I think everyone agrees there. Um, I think the challenge is really on the timelines. Is there the opportunity for us to accelerate the timeline? The current timeline would have the organization, at, sorry, Councilor, I'll answer sort of both things mm -hmm. at once if I can. Um, the current timeline would have the arm's length of full independence by 2023, 2024. Right now we're looking at a two year incubation cycle moving over to independence. The key trigger for independence is the negotiated um, MOU and SLA, service level agreement, between the uh, advisory panel and the city. So that's really what triggers the independence. If we can do that work faster, then we'd be able to move, sorry, thank you, Peter. Uh, we'd be able to move uh, at a different pace. A couple of considerations for us to be able to reduce the timeline would also be the budget. Right now, uh, the report you have in front of you uses the base operating budget of 372, which is included in the 2020 um, budget. Um, to figure Sorry. Yeah, I know, you're all trying to figure it out. Uh, Sorry, our base, yes, our base draft budget. Budget you're going to be considering. Sorry, um, the 372 is there. If we were to look at perhaps at budget during budget deliberation, discussing what additional support for the development agency could be in 2020, then perhaps we could even look at collapsing the 2020-2021 timeline. So there's definitely flexibility and we appreciate the need for and um, would wanna work with the panel to look at opportunities to bringing this agency to independence as soon as possible. The key thing really being a negotiated understanding between the city and this nonprofit organization, much with uh, Council Medeiros noted and Sharon herself, that it's really important that it's all understood the roles and responsibilities and that that initial SLA would have a three year term. So it would be sort of set and, and a commitment made to that. Um, as far as participation on the panel, we would absolutely um, expect that there would be members of the Brampton's local artist community, arts organization, independent artists, um, philanthropists, those who are, are patrons of the arts, to be participating members on that advisory panel, 100%, we would, we would expect that. Okay, thank you. Now, we, under, back in, I guess, 2018, mm -hmm. we had set aside, was it a million dollars? Was it? It was through the chair. The amount of money that was directed towards the development of the agency was the 372. So that was at the end of, help me with Victoria, at the, when we endorsed the council master plan? Correct. Uh, in 2018, at the time of the council master, culture master plan endorsement, $372,000 was earmarked for the 2019 budget cycle. And that money uh, was included in 2019 and therefore is also held in the 2020 budget. The, uh, through the chair, the million that you are likely referring to, Councilor Bowman, is what is the community grant program now? Community grants, okay. Yes. So I, I have to agree with, uh, with what our delegate has said. The timeline seems very long. Um, I was the liaison back in 2015 when, to the Arts Council when it was dissolved, unfortunately. Um, and we, uh, and we uh, have taken a very long time. I think we've been through three iterations of some form of study, of some form of uh, bringing in consultants to find out how we should form a committee and what our arts and culture really is in this city. Um, but I appreciate what you said, Kelly, between independence and establishment. I think that, that, that it's critical that we get this thing established as quickly as we possibly can 
get it up and running. Um, I think the artists would agree that having it established and working towards complete independence um, is, is something that we can do over a period of time, but the establishment needs to be done now. And what do we need to get that done now? Through the chair, for us to move forward today, it will be uh, approving the recommendations in the report to uh, move forward in the first steps of developing the advisory panel, the, the chair, and then that would begin uh, fundamentally this new organization incubated within um, the city of Brampton until such a time that the SLA and MOUs were negotiated between. At that point in time, the trigger would shift to independence of the uh, nonprofit <coughs> arm's length arts organization. Okay. That so the timelines that are sorry, oh, sorry, the timelines that are presented to you here today are in a very sort of strategic, timed with budget cycle and budget consideration to show what it could look like. Um, but certainly, there is the opportunity to shrink those timelines. Okay. Um, the, but the the key thing is to have the the chair and the panel in place to start the work. Yeah, because I think I think everybody can agree. I think council would agree that we have a very very vibrant arts community here in Brampton. 100%. That's doing great things without this support, I, exactly. and I can just imagine what can be done with this support. So um, I'm looking forward to it. But there are a couple of things I would like to amend on the recommendations, and that is to remove the last two uh, recommendations. As Councillor Maderos uh, mentioned, City Council is trying to get away from it. We're not. We don't want to be involved um, in the day-to-day -day running or the establishment because we're not experts and, and, and we don't know who should be getting the money and why. But I think um, number five says the chair and co-chair um, should review, provide input, and endorse the proposed chair. And number five says the mayor should be authorized to approve the chair. Um, council as a whole would, would I think, approve the chair. Um, and it's it's up to you guys to, to do the rest of that work and to come forward with your, your recommendations. So I'd just like to remove those two completely from the recommendations. Councillor Bowman, just for clarification, would you like to see five and six revised so that council make those approvals? Well, I think- Or do you want to strike them out altogether? I think if we just strike them out and put an addition five saying council will approve, I think that takes care of them both. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Santos. Um, thank you. Through you, Chair, uh, I agree with much of what Councillor Bowman has said and super excited about the ALO being um, formed and agree with the delegate, Sharon, to try to find ways to expedite it a lot sooner. We spoke about it during our briefing meetings as well, the possibilities for that. Essentially, it's about resources and how much money we can find to expedite the process. And I think there may be, as we look at different priorities within the portfolios, there may be ways to find money um, that is allocated somewhere within uh, this portfolio um, events or whatever it is that can be delayed until a further year so that we could top up the money for the ALO. So I, I have some thoughts um, and we could have a sideline conversation of where perhaps that might exist. Um, and then my other question is about 7.2.2-22 Appendix C um, and it's kind of in line with what my colleagues have talked about already. Um, but about specifically member seven, the city councillor, who's gonna sit on the advisory panel. It, it would be great for uh, the council to appoint who that councillor is gonna be versus the chair of the advisory panel to select what that councillor is gonna be. I just wanted to make that point, see if you have any comments on that. Um, through the chair, uh, we would agree. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Santos. Next up, I have Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, through the chair. So this, this is a really great initiative and I always think that the city works well being a facilitator um, and not trying to do everything because you know there are experts out there who are skilled at bringing in talent, organizing, let's put it in the hands of the experts. So can you just, um, because not everybody who may be watching 
have gone over the report. Mm -hmm. So can you just kind of give a little brief overview of what the benefits are for the arm's length organization? Uh, through the chair, the benefits to the community of having a development agency in addition to the work of the, yeah. of the city. Uh, certainly through the, through the chair. Um, there's a number of, of roles uh, that the new development agency would undertake. Uh, three sort of buckets, if we can put them in. One around the funding, finance, and investment, as the delegation spoke to today. Um, the community grant program has sort of aspirational goals for meeting uh, council priorities and uh, culture-specific funding could be better served through uh, an arm's length organization. So that funding, financing, investment, building a philanthropic um, sort of support in the community for arts and culture. Uh, there's a whole body of work around leadership and advocacy of having a voice that's outside of City Hall, being able to advocate on behalf of the artist community uh, to mayor and members of council, to staff as well. And there's a whole body of work around sector development and growth. And I think this is a really key and fundamental part to the city of Brampton's sort of success in um, economic development and, and business attraction and job retention. And it's really highlighting the importance of the arts and culture sector, what it does to bring, I mean, Sharon highlighted today a number of organizations that are doing incredible work, but this agency would actually be sort of the uh, much like similar to the Brampton Entrepreneur Center as the center for entrepreneurship in the city, uh, this agency would act as sort of the sector development body, uh, looking at professional development, promotion, um, training, education, really looking at how do we help those in the city of Brampton perhaps transition from um, emerging artists to professional artists? How do we help to build capacity in the nonprofit um, art sector so that they have, um, you know, strong board governance, they have the funding they require, the better conversation about operational support. So really it's the city working in collaboration with the development agency for the city to kind of uh, meet its aspirational goals. And, and I think arts and culture has been highlighted to Councillor Bowman's point earlier, since 2016 with the arts and culture panel, you know, the first body of work we undertook was the development of the first culture master plan. But the development agency or the, the sort of Arts Council 2.0 has always been a high priority of this community. And I think one that everybody's sort of been waiting for. I really do feel like um, this is sort of unlocking the potential of the arts and culture sector as a whole in Brampton. Absolutely, and thank you for, for giving that overview. Um, you know, I keep thinking about Artscape in Toronto. And you, you have the, out of Artscape, you have the Remix Project. So you yes. have so many different facets of the art sector located in a locate place where artists can really be connected to the industry and the industry can be connected to the artists, which is key for Brampton. We need to unlock that. We have many going to Artscape when they could be accessing a, a place of excellence here in Brampton. So the future of this relationship and this plan is extremely exciting. And I think there are many young people in the arts community who are excited about this as well. Um, so just a question about, um, you know, because some people might know or might not, would this advisory committee or um, this agency be responsible for the granting process? Uh, through the chair, the current community grant program is housed within the economic development and culture portfolio. However, it is a corporate program that meets um, and, and helps the community to deliver in partnership with the city on council priorities. So at this point in time, that program would continue as it does as the advanced Brampton Fund really focused on those four key council priorities. Uh, the, the obvious sort of next step and, and iteration for this panel once an independent nonprofit would be to develop those types of, of funding mechanisms that would come directly from this development agency. Mm -hmm. There would be more flexibility as an independent nonprofit for programs that would be direct to artist, that could be multi-year agreements, that could look at operational funding, which our current City of Brampton community grant program doesn't have the ability to do. Okay, so the, even the future of our arts um, granting process is going to evolve as we 
through the chair, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And we recognize the need in the community for art specific funding, so. While it's a slow process, the culture master plan is the first priority, development agency is the second priority. Now we really get to look at the programs and services that best actually support the development of the sector. I understand that it feels like it's been a while to get here, mm -hmm. but I do think that the city is making really smart decisions in building a really strong framework upon which we can build. Absolutely, and as long as we're continuing our dialogue and making sure we're encouraging the arts community to communicate with us at the city, let us know how, because like I said, they're the experts. They can drive this process. And um, you know, in, in response to uh, making sure that we are um, recognizing the impact and the people who've helped get the arts community to where yes. it is, um, how are the, the makeup of the members of the advisory um, panel? Can you kind of just give a whole highlight of that? So people who are watching and of course, are listening yep. can know. I'll let Victoria answer this one. Okay. Yes, please sit down. Are you in pain? Like, because the cast is just to stop her from getting re-injured. But Kelly, are you? I can still hear you. Are you in pain though? I hope not. Kelly, we still have seven more speakers. Just <laughs> have a seat. Yes. Uh, through the chair, um, in composing the uh, advisory panel membership, there are a number of considerations that go into how we build that, and that includes uh, sector representation organizational experience and knowledge and skills coming to the table. And the matrix that you see before you really just speaks to a guideline of what we would see as a minimum that would be required to uh, develop this panel. And as you can see, we have uh, a chair, uh, a member with financial experience, uh, human resources and organizational experience, uh, community uh, expertise, a creative entrepreneur, artist, and a city councilor liaison. Uh, in consultation with Purobi, our uh, wonderful consultants on this project, this definitely does not preclude um, the inclusion of any further expert advisors um, or subcommittees or, or subpanels that could be formed mm -hmm. uh, to support the work of this, of this panel, specifically around uh, local expertise, youth, uh, other sort of sector-specific priorities that mm -hmm. might come up. So this is really a baseline, and once we have the leadership in place, we're happy to work alongside them to grow this from there. Okay, that's great to know. And um, you know, especially making sure that we are uh, being kind of broad in, in who we're looking for in age, young people, people of different community groups. Um, you know, it, it's so important because uh, the arts is, is so robust. Yes. And um, so we want that robustness to be reflective of this, this panel. Um, thank you. No other questions. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor uh, Thank you. Um, I'm just collecting my thoughts a little bit because um, I'm a little bit confused because I think we're trying to get it away from Council, but now we're coming back to Council for approval of the chair. So I'm confused of what our intention is. <laughs> so, because um, initially when I saw this report, I'll be honest, I thought one member council was not enough. Uh, because in the incubation phase, I thought maybe we should have two counselors and slowly uh, remove uh, that counselor. Because my, my biggest, I guess it's all based on fear. And my biggest fear is that this becomes something that um, has its own uh, core, its own identity. Um, loses touch with the reality of the artist and the art scene here, whereas as counselors, we all have really grassroots connections uh, with artists, with community groups, and sometimes when they don't get the, um, get access to our resources, at least we hear about it, we can help with that, and we'll lose all that control. So it makes me nervous, but having read the report and reflecting on it, I understand what uh, the consultant recommended. I understand what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so, but then now with the, the amendment, we're bringing it back to council where I think having the chair and vice chair look at it already starts to detach it from council a little bit and we can move more towards independence instead of coming back the other way uh, towards council. So I don't know how I feel about uh, that amendment. I'd be okay with the chair and vice chair economic development culture, given that it is their portfolio, um, 
to uh, pick the chair or, or give input on the chair. Um, and otherwise, um, I think the timelines are fair, to be honest, because incubation will have um, three iterations, it looks like, of the advisory uh, right here. Yeah, three iteration of the advisory panel before we move to a board. So we'll get learning out of uh, this as well over the next three, four years before we make it independent. And I think that makes me more comfortable. Um, those iterations and the learning and the improvements we can make uh, three different times um, to be comfortable enough to let this thing go a bit more independent. So I'm very comfortable with the timeline. Um, and I guess I do have some fear because of the arts community, when I talk to the arts community, and, and you know, I know a lot of the artists, uh, they are very nervous because they actually commend our staff uh, right now. They, they think the process is fair. They think s the staff is really connected uh, to, the, um, to the art scene, to the, uh, the community groups. And so the challenge of any change you bring, it always brings fear. Uh, and so, uh, as you know, I've had some people communicate that, but I understand what we're trying to do. I think the timelines uh, are fair, and um, I, I will be supporting this. So, thank you. Councilor, <coughs> how's your question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, I also have some fear, um, but I guess my fear is, is based on, um, you know, our 2014-15 uh, council that uh, ended up uh, killing the Arts Council um, and how does that not repeat itself and I don't know how if it's if it's arm's length or if it's kept close to council I don't I don't really know what works it was clearly political interference last time um, it was a few members of council that didn't like uh, members of the Arts Council it was a few members of council that didn't like the former mayor that was funding the Arts Council uh, or providing some funds to the Arts Council. So how do we not repeat uh, history and maybe one day down the road, um, there's members of council that don't like the direction of the Arts Council and, and want to squash it. I know it's a very political uh, question, but it's the reality of the world we live in. So how, how do we ensure that this doesn't happen again? Through the chair, uh, I think one of the best things we can do to uh, ensure the, the future and ongoing success of this organization is the upfront incubation period that we're recommending to start the organization right, to build trust with council and with the community, and to have the support of the Economic Development and Culture Division and city as a whole in making sure that everything gets off on the right foot. While we can't foresee the future, we can support it over the next few years to make sure that everything is set up as well as it possibly can be. Okay. So, I, and, I, uh, and I like and I appreciate the answer. Um, I guess it's, um, with, the, with members of council on the Arts Council, and I don't know, um, I, I'm really indifferent right now on who sits on that Arts Council, but typically when a member of council sits on a committee, they're kind of that advocate back at um, at council. So if there's if there's two members, then you know that that's great. Um, and then, but those members they'll drop off once it's once it's arm's length. Is that correct? Uh, I believe that I would like to defer that question to uh, our consultant, Kurobi, just to advise on uh, the role of a city council member in an independent board situation. Uh, Chair, councillors, thank you for the opportunity um, to respond to this. So, I mean, the recommendation currently is that uh, you might expect the uh, ultimately independent non-profit board to have um, uh, one or, or more, but I think we recommend one uh, member of council on the board. That's, that's relatively standard practice. Um, which is which is why, in part, it's recommended. It's also recommended because it provides this incredibly useful conduit between uh, the organisation representing the arts, culture, and creative industries community and council. Um, so that is recommended. Um, in some cases, for larger organisations in in other jurisdictions, uh, in the GTHA, you would have two councillors. I think that 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 you may go there. 
at some time in the future, but this is going to be a growing organization. So our expectation is when it becomes an independent not-for-profit organization, which, you know, is, as you've heard, potentially could be, you know, in a relatively short time span, uh, subject to kind of a successful incubation, um, we expect the, the sort of founding independent board might have nine to 12 members, of which one might be a councillor, and of course you might also expect staff to have the opportunity to attend as an observer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so regardless if it's if it's one or two now, um, once it's uh, once it's arm's length and, and the um, uh, the paperwork's all complete, um, those those councillors will remain, or whatever the choosing of a council will. <coughs> okay, um, the timeline doesn't prohibit like the money goes. There's money there now. There's money there now, and it continues, and it doesn't prohibit. Um, this advisory uh, panel to to do some similar things of when it's going to be an arm's length organization. Correct. Okay. Um, and just based on some of the concerns uh, around the timeline, um, I guess it's can we just say that it's it, it'll continue to be a working progress, and if we can shorten those timelines, we will definitely work hard to try and shorten those timelines. Yes. Through, this, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> through the chair, as, as Kelly mentioned earlier, the first step is getting that chair, the leader of this uh, panel, in place. And from there, we can start talking about where things could be expedited and what resources that could need. We're very happy to help support that. Okay. Um, then just based on, on that and some of the comments that, about who selects the chair, uh, once the advisory panel is... Um, is established, can it not be the advisory panel select the chair internally? Uh, through the chair, um, the process is actually um, the reverse that we would recommend. The chair plays such an integral role mm -hmm. in starting this uh, panel and this work outright that you want to make sure you have that leadership in place first and they would play a key role in building out the rest of the panel and getting the remainder of the, the balance of the right people and the right skill sets around the table. And the re recommendation for chair is gonna come from staff? Through the chair, that's correct. Uh, staff is considering um, various support mechanisms to assist us in this, like uh, board recruitment um, agencies that could really help to um, facilitate that process and recruit uh, top talent for this position. Okay. We thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Willens. You're up. Oh, <coughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for the report. Um, thank you for uh, Council Bowman for striking out five and six. I agree. And thank you, uh, Sharon, for pointing out in Wikipedia that uh, the arms length organization shouldn't be politically influenced. Politically supported, definitely, but not politically influenced. And I'm okay with a, a member sitting on the council because this is sort of going towards. Uh, what we're doing with our community energy plan and our Institute for Sustainable Brampton. It's along the same lines. The task force is created. They look at funding opportunities, working with FCM, working with different groups. There's no council going to be sitting on that one. I, to my knowledge, I don't think there is, but there may be, but it won't be to influence the committee and be there to help support and see what the city can do to help move things forward. So this is good. Thanks for the report and uh, support it. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, permission to speak? Thank you, Kelly and Victoria, for the tireless work that you and the rest of your team have been undertaking over the past five years to bring us to this point here. Um, I want to echo uh, some of the thoughts of members of council that I believe that this can be expedited and uh, shortened. Um, I won't say by how much. I'll leave that uh, to staff to find the right balance. Uh, we don't want to do it too quickly and then not be successful, and at the same time, we don't want it to take so long that we continue to lose talent in the city. Um, I sat in this chamber uh, on the day that the Arts Council uh, found out that their funding had been cut to a point where they could no longer survive and could no longer be a going concern. And so we have uh, waited a long time to see this organization reestablished, and we would like to see it done as quickly as possible. And uh, Thank you, Councillor, for striking out six, and uh, I think that that is the best way for us to proceed. I see no other speakers on the board, so I have a motion from Councillor Bowman 
to receive uh, the report as amended. A recorded vote has been requested. A recorded vote's been requested on the motion as moved by Councillor Bowman on the screen. All in favour, please stand to be counted. Showing in favour is Councillor Dillon, Councillor Singh, Councillor Fortini, Councillor Williams, Councillor Medeiros, Chair Visante, Councillor Bowman, Councillor Paleshi, Councillor Willens, Councillor Santos. Mr. Chair, the motion carries unanimously 10 to 0. Congratulations to the art community. Thank you. Thank you, members of committee. We are now, uh, I believe, completed our delegations. And we're now moving into the economic development and culture section. Item 7.2.1 was in consent. We have dealt with item 7.2.2. We have no other new business or correspondence. Do any members of council have any questions? with regards to any item that we have dealt with today so far. Seeing none. For public question period, do any members of the public have any questions with regards to items that we have dealt with here so far? Seeing none. We have a corporate services section to be chaired by Councillor Singh. Councillor, the floor is yours. All right, we'll begin the corporate service sex section. 8.1, seeing no staff uh, presentations, we'll move on to the reports. 8.2.1, status of general accounts receivable was put in consent. 8.2.2 uh, has been uh, deferred to council, re referred to council. Uh, we will move on to 8.2.3, referred matters list update and councillor information requests. Uh, seeing councillor Bowman. Thank you very much through you, Mr. Chair. Just very quickly, I went through the referred matters list. Um, it was probably two months ago, I guess, that I had requested, um, and I think it was moved to referred matters, that we get a breakdown of all the costs of consultants by department. Um, but I didn't see that on the referred matters list, so I wanted to make sure that that request is still in place, and uh, it will appear on the referred matters list before budget. Uh, I, I believe in the clerk and verify that might have been, <laughs> I know we're, we're delineating referred matters from councillor information requests. I believe it might have been a councillor information request rather than a formal motion. Uh, in either case, we are uh, looking at that and we'll bring it forward as part of the budget process, which is next month. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Councillor Vicent. Thank you. Um, as the uh, chair of works, I'd like to... Uh, ask that uh, we remove from this list RM 19-2019. Sorry, could you repeat that? Sorry, we're looking at item RM 19-2019, which is a traffic calming option for neighborhood streets. Yes. And okay. uh, we would like to, um, first of all, um, I've had conversations with staff. This motion was passed approximately a year ago. And uh, I think that it would be appropriate if staff um, could provide us with an update, um, even just oral update on what has been done in their work to date so far. Would staff uh, be able to comment on that? Uh, through, you? The chair, we, through the chair, we could certainly uh, bring a verbal update at our next uh, committee of council. I'm wish. sorry, I can't hear you, sorry. We could certainly bring a verbal update on the traffic calming measures that we've implemented to date at our next uh, committee of council, if council desires. Okay, that, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Um, so turn, are you asking for, uh, just to clarify with the clerk as well, what would be the best, your verbal update is okay, so 
Would it still be a referred matter? Is that really a report, mm -hmm. technically? Or? Yeah. So through you, Mr. Chair, I just yeah. wish to clarify with Councillor Vasante. I think you said traffic calming options. There is an RM, that, which is on the list, which is, my apologies, is on the screen as RM 19 2019 regarding traffic calming options for neighborhoods right here. Is that the item that you're referring to? Because if it, if it is, um, we are recommending that it be removed from the RML list because it will be incorporated into the pending report coming in Q1 so, on traffic Mr. calming. Clark, so to clarify, we do not want it removed. We would like a verbal update from staff, and if possible, if it can be done by the next committee of council meeting, that would be great. Um, and we would like to uh, perhaps hear from staff on what options they have been exploring and what options they may have for the future. We can certainly provide a, a verbal update at our, at our next committee. Okay. Thank you. So will it be removed once a verbal update is made? Just, to, just technically, just to get it. Through you, Mr. Chair, it would be removed from the next version of the RML list if, because the next committee of council meeting Got is January 29th, so it'll Perfect. be dealt with at that meeting. Okay. Thank you. Do any other uh, members of council have any questions? Okay. Permission to speak for the chair? Yeah. I just wanted to thank uh, staff for uh, the workshop. Uh, it was a very uh, meaningful workshop. I think uh, it was a win-win for everybody. Uh, you know, so thank you to the clerk and the CAO's office uh, for coordinating that and, you know, getting us focused on our priorities. We have an aggressive list and look forward to working together. But thank you. Thank you for everything. So, uh, my mic. Could I get a motion to um, approve the recommendations and, uh, sorry, to receive the report? Okay, Councillor Willens, all those in favor? Thank you. And uh, moving on to 8.2.4, uh, Community Recognition Program and 2020 commemorative uh, dates. We have uh, a report in front of us with recommendations. I do have a motion because something was spelled, uh, there was a spelling error, so I'm just gonna put that motion up as well. So through you, Mr. Chair, perhaps if, if, if it's just a spelling correction, we will make that correction to CALSA. Okay, okay CALSA. In okay. Appendix B, I believe missing? it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, just to make it happy CALSA day only, because um, uh, the SACI is not the actual proper, it's, it's, it's CALSA day. Okay. okay. So then through you, Mr. Chair, then it would be an amendment to okay. Appendix yeah. B just to say when happy CALSA day, day with That's an H. That's a technical term. Yeah. All the parades are called CALSA days as well. Um, okay. So... Need a motion then, I guess, or? Yeah, okay. Just a motion to uh, make that happy call today with an H and with Basaki. Yeah. As read? Can I? Yeah. As read. All those in favor? I'm on the oh, yep. Yeah. Councilor Williams? Yep. Yeah. Um, thank you. Through the chair, I was just looking through the list on 8.2.45. Of the um, the dates, and I noticed that Purple Shirt Day for Children's Aid wasn't on that list. Oh, Is there a good. reason why it wasn't considered? Since we did the proclamation last um, last year, I can say it feels like yesterday. Hi, Councillor. Um, so this list were the dates that the corporation will take a lead on commemorating. What we want, didn't want to do is take away from the community their opportunity to come forward. So mm. last year, that day, we had the community come forward to do that. So we still wanted this program to have things like proclamations and flag raising so that they could come forward and we would support them through that. So what we didn't want to do is take away from the community the opportunity for them to celebrate. So a proclamation would still be available, council support. Uh, communication support would still be available okay. for, for Purple Shirt Day. If that's, unless if council wants to make the decision to add it to this list, then they can do that. Give them an opportunity to come. Yeah, I, I thank you through the chair. I think it, it's still great that they would be able to come and uh, delegate. So maybe we can present them with the possibility of having it added, um, but at, at their um, request and at their lead. So let, let them make that decision. But thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Willens? <clears throat> yeah, just quickly. Um, under the, I guess it's the clock lighting, or the tower lighting, um, 
can we, will there be opportunities for us? Because there was one that I didn't know of and then I think <coughs> Michael Warren helped me get, get the lights on. It was uh, Waste Reduction Week. And we, I didn't know anything about it. It was one of the residents contacted our, our office and said that other municipalities are doing it. So if we recognize them, can we get them to you? I don't want staff to do it. I'm just if, if there's other people that yeah, are absolutely. municipalities doing something that we're aware of to pass it on to you. Yeah, if you could just send it to the protocol okay. office, and then we'll work with communications and facilities to make sure that the lighting is, is done and that the communication is posted okay. on social media. It, we don't need staff to do it. If yeah. other councillors have other municipalities, we can present it to you guys. Okay, thanks. Okay, and uh, I just wanted to um, thank you, actually. I know you've been working hard on the Air Canada flight. Uh, 621 and I saw it on the, the list as well and I think that'll be very meaningful I didn't know anything about it myself and it happened in our area so um, I look forward to seeing what the city does but thank you for pardon is it your is it? no it's ours it's Castlemore pardon it's in Castlemore it's in Castlemore yeah anyways anyways um, whoever the area affected uh, Brampton, it's an important part of our uh, city. And uh, thank you for taking the uh, lead on that. Thank you. Okay. So um, can I get a motion to receive the recommendations with changes? Okay. All those in favor? Thank you. Motion carries. And all right. And Seeing other new business, I think we have uh, 8.3.1, a discussion item at the request of uh, City Councilor Williams, uh, alternative payment <laughs> option for city services. Uh, thank you. So um, the Christmas season, one of the, the busiest gift and receiving seasons has passed and uh, I don't think there's a single person in this room who hasn't either given a gift card or received a gift card and uh, you know, I've heard in the past people saying, well, wouldn't it be great if I would like to have that option to give a gift card for my kids, grandkids, my niece, my nephew, whoever, so that I can pay for their swimming, their recreational activities. Um, and even my assistant and I were just talking about it before Christmas. And, you know, I think there's, there's no uh, monopoly on a good idea. And um, so I really appreciate people coming forward and saying, you know, this would be really great for us to see in the city. So. Um, I, I'm just looking for a report on this and um, hopefully everyone can support it so we can just have some information um, and hopefully see the future of gift cards here at the city. So um, the motion is there on the screen. Um, whereas many private sector businesses use gift cards as a means to improve sales and customer retention and whereas gift cards offer an opportunity for friends and relatives to prepay for goods and services on behalf of others and whereas Brampton aspires to be a more customer-friendly organization that serves as many residents as possible in a seamless manner, and uh, whereas many residents have expressed a desire to be able to purchase city services like recreation classes for friends and relatives in a way that is easily transferable and secure. Therefore, be it resolved that the CAO and appropriate city staff be directed to prepare a report which outlines possible opportunities for the city to create a City of Brampton branded gift card option for residents to purchase. The report should offer various options, which include, but not exclusive to, developing the gift card program in-house or contracting an external developer or utilizing a white label program that already exists. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Madero. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Thank you, Councillor Williams, for uh, bringing this forward. Unfortunately, um, it's not something I'm willing to support or, or look at. Um, I guess before I go off on uh, my opinion, I would uh, go to, uh, I'm not sure if our CEO. Um, presently, if we want to access services at the city, uh, we accept credit cards, right? We accept visas? Correct. So as far as I know through the chair, uh, you can purchase those gift visas at department stores or at you know wherever they, they sell these cards. Um, for something like this, for us to produce our own gift cards, um, that's, that would be a new line of business here at the city. Is that correct? Uh, sorry, it would be? It would be a new business line. It's not, it's not a business that we do producing gift cards. Correct. Okay. So. Um, through the chair, 
um, and, and not to put you in, in, in a position, say, oh, but for the administration of gift cards would require further resources uh, on in an area which, as far as I know, don't meet our priorities as a council, nor have I ever, as a councillor since 2014, ever once heard uh, the suggestion. And I'm not saying that you haven't heard it, and you probably have. I do appreciate the fact that this is maybe a creative thinking out of the box way, um, but just previous to some of your comments before, uh, why take in something where that expertise already exists? It's a service that already exists outside the city, and uh, I'm not sure if uh, we want to get into this line of business. So respectfully, I appreciate you know these fine ideas. Um, I wouldn't don't want to spend staff's time uh, uh, chasing uh, uh, an idea, which how creative it can be. Uh, I think that's something maybe uh, you know, uh, councillor, uh, um, that's probably uh, close to you. Um, but you know, we just talked about our referred matters list. Uh, we just talked about all the issues that we have here at the city. Uh, we got a couple years to go, and for us to go in a completely different business, and we're coming up to budget. So uh, I don't, I, I don't want to uh, have staff. It'd be unfair for staff to look at it. There's all this regulation and legislation that applies uh, to these uh, financial cards, and uh, I just think that we're getting into a mess. Um, but you know, again. Uh, I do have to appreciate that, uh, 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 you know, you come forth with an idea that's uh, creative and I think that you're uh, uh, looking at ways in which we can provide uh, happiness to our residents. Um, but, you know, I just question, um, you know, respectfully, uh, what kid would want to wake up on Christmas and get a, a card from the city of Brampton? Um, so, but, you know, with that said, I, I appreciate it. And uh, like I said, I, it's not something I could support. Okay, Councillor Santos. Thank you, through, chair, through you, uh, Chair, I do share the same sentiment as um, Councillor Majeros uh, on this. I, I am concerned, like we just went through and applauded staff and our work on the referred matters list. We are looking at a core service review. We're looking at um, prioritizing our focus as a council to really look at our strategic priorities and a core service review. I'm wondering if the CAO can share with us what that list looks like right now. Thank you, Councillor. Through the Chair, um, it's no secret that uh, this is an ambitious uh, Council and there's no shortage of work, certainly from a staff perspective. Uh, as you know, we've been working diligently to tackle the referred matters list, as you highlighted and just spoke about. Um, I had a meeting uh, recently with KPMG as per council direction with respect to the nine operational reviews then to be submitted through to KPMG and to come back to you, which it will shortly. Uh, they've identified on the surface as a result of those operational reviews um, upwards of 74 uh, initiatives within those uh, that will be coming forward uh, also. Uh, there's 22 council um, priorities and your term of council priorities. There's five plus large corporate projects on top of the 2040 uh, vision. And so certainly uh, staff implement council decisions. And uh, my uh, caution is that those uh, initiatives and these um, workload uh, come with resources and resource requests. And so the, the risk is the current uh, staffing complement and capacity to um, work through the tremendous list of um, uh, initiatives. Uh, that'll be part of probably a budgetary uh, discussion to help focus and prioritize. So when there's, you know, 100 plus uh, initiatives and, and priorities, there's really no priorities. So we have to maintain focus, uh, and I'm doing my best from a staffing perspective to, to maintain focus uh, on delivering for, for this council. Um, this particular item, uh, seems uh, innocuous on the surface. Uh, however, there, there's a value proposition there with respect to, I think, the questions that are being asked in terms of staff capacity, um, notwithstanding the, an, an additional administrative layer in terms of administering the, the, the program and the staffing, the uh, financial risk uh, to the corporation with respect to uh, staff loading up cards and the inventory control and auditing uh, portion of that. And with the convenience um, currently of the various payment options throughout the corporation, 
uh, I go back to the value proposition. Uh, on the surface, we haven't done a drill down. I'm you know, seeing this for, for, for the first time, certainly. Um, but uh, I can tell you and uh, other experiences that uh, there is a cost to offering that, and including financial and uh, also staff. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, Council. We're obviously, we'll implement whatever Council is uh, asking. Mm -hmm. but those are some comments that you've asked for. Right. So thank you through you, Chair. I appreciate the sentiment and the creative thinking and um, idea behind it. Certainly, Council Vicente and I haven't <laughs> seen the market demand for City of Brampton gift cards. Um, we haven't heard residents express to us that they want something like that. And um, if I wanted to, for example, give my niece dance lessons for the city of Brampton, I would do that online. Like the, the, the opportunities already exist. So for me, this is just adding an extra layer of work for us in a market um, that essentially we are not experts in. Um, so um, while it is a nice idea, to consider, I am with Councilor Majeros and won't be supporting referring this back to staff because, quite frankly, as we've discussed now, I'd rather staff focus on the much bigger priorities we have in the city. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councilor Willens. <coughs> yeah, thank you through uh, through you, Chair. Um, I don't need to tell you how I feel about some of the programs we're running at our rec centers, like the gyms and the tracks, when we have good light fitness down the road from my place, it's <laughs> 24 hours a day. But um, Al, maybe you can answer the question. I think it. I think Councillor uh, Santos answered it for me. Um, if I wanted to buy a gift card for my brother, or if I wanted to buy a, a gym membership at a, at a city facility for my brother, I could go in there and put, pay for it, put my brother's name on, do it, and then he could go and provide his personal information. Could I not do that? Now, under our current system? Uh, through the chair, I believe that is correct. So, okay. So if somebody wanted to gift something to somebody, they could just go do it and just say, I've gifted it to Martin Medeiros because he's gaining weight and he's coming down. He's coming down. So I could do that theoretically anyway now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Williams. Thank you to the chair. I do I hear what um, some of the, the councillors are saying, and, and I, I respect the decisions. Um, you know, I think one of the, the, the interesting thing about gift cards, especially with many successful businesses, they do see it as an opportunity to increase their revenue. Um, and, you know, there's statistics out there that say that people, 72% uh, of people who get a gift card end up spending more than what the gift card is, is valued for. And also about what 25% of people end up um, purchasing things for themselves and coming back. So this op could potentially open up another revenue stream and more customers who may be interested in accessing our city programs. It br brings people into our rec centers and it also gives another option. Right now, yes, you have to have a credit card to purchase your recreational activities, but the fact is not many people in the city of Brampton have credit cards. And it actually restricts a number of our residents from participating in recreational activities. Uh, we don't have visa debit opportunities. And, and so, you know, when you look at possibilities for extended, who knows, anybody, like grandparents or whatever, sometimes it's just the convenience. So being able to put money on the gift card, it, it allows families who do not have that credit card um, and allows families who or parents who may not have the time to go out and get the gift card themselves, it just kind of opens up another door and a possibility for revenue stream. So, you know, those are my thoughts. And, and I, like, again, I respect everyone's decision and, and how it goes, but uh, it's, it's an opportunity to explore um, another way to bring in more people and spending and uh, to spend more money at the city of Brampton. Thanks. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor Vicente. Thank you. I, I wasn't going to speak on this one, but I just thought I would add some additional insights. Uh, having worked um, in the marketing industry and having had a lot of exposure to uh, retailers all across this country, I can tell you that uh, the administration of gift cards is a nightmare. It is highly problematic. Uh, it has required governments to apply additional rules and regulations that make it more difficult for uh, retailers to um, offer them. 
And in the end, <clears throat> one of the problems and one of the things that kind of sucks about gift cards is that uh, folks, uh, the money gets spent, it goes to the retailer, and then folks don't use them. Mm -hmm. And so that's another thing that I think, we, you know, kind of makes gift cards frowned upon. They're, they're an impersonal gift sometimes because, um, you know, you just can't think about what to get the person uh, if it's a present or a gift. Uh, I agree with uh, Councillor Willens in the sense that, you know, you can go and uh, purchase a membership for someone and gift that to them directly. Um, and so um, I think that this is beyond really uh, what our mandate is and what we do here at the City of Brampton. And for that reason, I would uh, respectfully not support this. And I think we should have a recorded vote on this. Thank you. All right, a recorded vote has been requested. Um, we'll do uh, standing. We'll do a standing recorded vote. All those in favor, please stand. All in favor, show is, uh, in favor is Councillor Dillon, Councillor Williams. All opposed, please stand to be counted. Showing as opposed is Councillor Fortini, Councillor Medeiros, Chair Singh, Councillor Bowman, Councillor Willens, Councillor Vasante, Councillor Santos. Mr. Chair, the motion does not carry two to seven with one absence. All right, thank you. Moving on to 8.3.3, uh, that was a discussion item uh, that I added. Um, we, oh, apologies, my mistake. 8.3.2 is a request by Regional Council for Tini on the Advanced Brampton Funding Program Submission Approval to Timelines. myself and Council Madero sat on the senior committee and they were complaining about the grants. Maybe come up with that question. That they didn't have enough time to, to do the application during the holidays. Uh, I thought we kind of fixed it last term. So I was back there on the June 7th and they raised concern to us because a lot of them don't come back until the middle of February and they don't have time to do these grants. So I'm asking to maybe extend it until the 19th of February because now I understand there's some sports people want to get out. That's fine. You can still carry on with those, but there's other ones. We've got to give them time if they're not here. A lot of them go away. Through the chair, uh, Councillor Fortini, I, I completely hear what you're saying, okay. and um, we would be pleased to extend okay. the deadline for the Advanced Brampton Fund to accommodate the seniors' okay. uh, applications. Uh, I believe we provided the clerk's office with um, just a, a schedule of what these timeline changes would have as an impact on the other end of the program. Um, at this point, that would look like basically a, a one-month extension. Again, we're, we're pleased to do that. Um, the report back date we would be able to make for council on that would be April the 15th. So I just wanted to um, bring that to your attention and make sure that we were all uh, comfortable with the, the impact of that extension on the other end. So you're gonna extend it to April 15th? No, uh, oh. if you look at the, the last column on the chart here, this yep. was um, the impact of a, an approximate one month extension to Good. the deadline. Okay. If we were to extend it um, by one month, this just demonstrates um, the anticipated uh, shift in timelines. I'm just saying, so if we have applications coming in now and it's expiring, uh, that really need, like the sports, I know they have to plan ahead. We can still continue processes, so, but other ones, like a lot of them are away, so just don't give them a deadline, give them, give them an extra month, that's all they're asking. Yes, so. through the chair, uh, yes, absolutely. Okay. The, uh, the sport tourism um, uh, stream of granting that the city offers has been separated and is a totally separate issue now and we would be pleased to offer the deadline okay. extension. Good, thank you. That's all. Um, thank you, Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, in principle, I support the request for additional time. I think sometimes it is difficult for these groups to get themselves organized and have all of their ducks in a row to submit a proper application. Um, one concern I have, though, with the extension, perhaps staff can comment, is that uh, when you uh, push out uh, the, the the date upon which they know that they're going to get the funding, that sometimes can put the um, event at risk. And so can we, um, if there are events that need to know sooner rather than are able to wait, 
uh, for an April 15th deadline as opposed to a beginning of April or end of March, uh, middle of March. Is there some way that um, we can mitigate that issue and give them some indication of uh, what is happening and what is the likelihood of their application being successful to whatever degree? Uh, through the chair. The, we can look into that and uh, report back. The challenge is that when we are allocating grant funding, uh, we need to be looking at all of the applications at the same time to, to allocate funds based on the scores they receive from the evaluators. So I think that might be challenging, but again, we could, we could look into it and see if there was something that could be done. Okay. Because uh, another challenge, too, and Councillor Pileshi mentioned this, is that um, not knowing if you're getting a City of Brampton grant uh, to fill out your entire uh, plan, your business plan for the event that you're hosting, can put other grants at risk as well. And so um, I'm willing to support the motion to extend the deadline, but uh, my only concern is that if we do so, uh, it may cause some issues for some of the groups. Um, not every group has reserves uh, in, an, in a bank account that would allow them to proceed with an event if they don't get funding. Um, and so uh, I think we can do this, Councillor Fertini, but um, look forward to seeing that it, it goes off without any hitch. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fertini. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, what I was trying to say is, if you have an application coming in now, and these sports groups, I understand they have to plan ahead. We can still continue processing them now, or do we have to wait for a deadline for them to do it all at once? Uh, through the chair, as I mentioned, um, regardless of what uh, kind of group is coming to the table, if they are applying to the Advanced Brampton Fund because of the methodology of allocating funds based on score. Uh, ideally, we would be looking at them all at the same time so that we can divide out that funding um, based on their evaluation score. So there would be some challenges to processing certain applications ahead of others. Okay, so moving it up that month, will it affect them, these sports groups and other people? Because, you know, uh, it, or will it make a big difference or not? Uh, through the That's chair. Uh, if we were to extend the deadline um, by one month, it would essentially change um, the timing that people hear about the status of their grant and the timeline for receiving that money by one month on the other end. Uh, potentially, uh, a compromise could be a two-week extension. That's what I've asked. Like I see the month. I, I, I thought it was two weeks, maybe till the end of the month or the first week of February, you're bringing it all the way to the 16th. So I don't want to hurt another group to help another group. So I figured as they come in, we could actually process the application. We only get 200 all at once. But I didn't know it was going to, you guys do it that way. <laughs> so uh, I don't want to hurt a group here to help another group. So. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. uh, through the chair. Um, perhaps a, a two-week extension, given the fact that we do have to look at all the applications at the same time, could be a fair compromise to meet everyone's needs. Well, I would also want to just mention that we do have the micro stream of the grant program that's open on a monthly basis, yeah. and that offers up to $1,000 in funding to resident-led groups. I understand that that level of support doesn't quite meet everyone's needs, but that would be the other opportunity. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it maybe around the 4th or the 5th of February, two weeks is fine. I don't want to give it to the 16th if it's going to affect other groups, so I, and I get that. Uh, when the applications come in, we'll actually, if someone makes a mistake on it, when they come in, we call them or we're going to end up, remember the Tamil community came in last year, we don't want to come back to council and say, hey, we, because once you process the, or they submit the applications, uh, David called me the other night, he forgot to add something. Now, you can't submit a, that extra document. Once it's done, it kind of closes it. You can't just resubmit if you forget something? Uh, through the chair, the first part of the process um, after the closing date is a review of the eligibility of all of the organizations. And if there is something uh, very basic and very straightforward that a group has um, omitted for some reason, uh, it is part of our, our customer service approach that we would follow up with them to the best of our ability. Uh, if there is something um, 
perhaps not quite so obvious at the outset. Uh, that might be an additional challenge, but you know, essentially we are here to help people succeed. I think I didn't explain myself. So it expires on the 19th. He submitted the application already last week. He forgot to add a couple more things into it. So when you try to submit those other two things, it won't take it. It closes it. Sure. So I told him, bring it by hand. So uh, if it closes in front of let's say on the 19th, he should be able to submit every day if you have more information and more stuff. Through the chair, uh, thank you for bringing that yes. to my attention. I'll speak with our team and we'll okay. have um, someone follow up with him to obtain those additional documents and we will review the system to see if there's some kind of mechanism to help avoid that in the future. So we're going to change it then to two weeks? That would be fine. Yeah, because it's like I said, I don't want to affect another group over one. So I was going to get yelled on the other side. <laughs> okay, thank you. So is this a motion, Councillor Fischer, that you ask? No, just a okay. So there's a motion in front of us. Uh, seeing nobody has questions regarding the motion, all those in favor? So, through you, Mr. Chair. So the current deadline is a Sunday at 11:59. So February 2nd is identified as the revised date. There's also a, a deadline for questions, uh, in consultation with staff, and that's been adjusted as well to January 31st. Okay. Any questions? Through the chair, uh, we're happy to support the will of council in terms of, of a deadline. So you would like Monday, February 3rd? come in on a Saturday? Well, consultation, right? It's on a Friday in case they cannot make it. It's at 12 p.m. So we My, to, just, to just for clarification, what, are you saying, or will staff will not respond on it? Will they re yeah, they're not gonna respond on a Saturday, right? Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. yeah, Friday, Friday is appropriate there, and Monday makes sense too, so I think. Okay. okay? Fine. Right? So we have the motion in front of us. Any members, do any members have any questions to the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. And moving on to 8.3.3, uh, that was uh, just a discussion item that I added. Um, we had a delegation about uh, health care uh, before the break, and some doctors uh, reached out, uh, concerned Ontario doctors. A lot of them are from Brampton, clients of Brampton, so they'll be coming to delegate for next week. Just want to let uh, members know and thank you for the clerk's office for coordinating that it takes a lot of effort for them to take time out to come and Thank you, and I look forward to their delegation um, Do any members have questions? Seeing none moving on to uh, Councilor question period Do any members have any questions Social services seeing none public question period Okay Seeing none, I'm going to, with permission from uh, Chair Vicent and Chair Santos, I'm going to go through the next sections as well. Uh, for Public Works and Engineering section, um, in consent, we had the minutes for 9.3.1 and 9.3.2. Uh, so I'll move on to Councillor's question period. Do any members have any uh, questions? Seeing none, public question period. Seeing none, moving on to Community Services. Uh, report 10.2.1 was dealt with uh, earlier. Uh, report 10.2.2 uh, was uh, uh, removed. Uh, and uh, the minutes for 10.3.1 and 10.3.2 uh, were approved in consent. Uh, moving on to 10.5, Councillor question period. Do any members have any questions? Seeing none. Uh, am I getting ahead or you're getting ahead? There is correspondence? There's no? No. 10.4. Yeah. 10 <laughs> yep. 10.5, Councillor question period. Councillor Willens? Nope. Keep oh, going. Okay. Sorry I deleted you. Get back on there. Uh, public question period, 10.6. Seeing none, uh, 11 is a referred matters list. Uh, 12, public question period, 15 minute limit. Slow down a little if there's any members. Public question period, seeing none. Uh, for closed session, um, Oh, Councillor Williams has a question. 
Yeah. Yes, sir, you chair, I wanted to the clerk, um, since there's only one item now on the closed session agenda, it's the Sports Hall of Fame committee meetings. It was the selection of the members. Can we move that out into open and vote on the minutes, assuming everybody has read it? Just move, move in close. Through you, Mr. Chair, yes. I'll just move it, in close. It can be acknowledged uh, in public session without the need to go into closed. The contents of that still remain confidential until yeah. it's publicly released. Yes. Thank you. So, do we need a motion? Yep. Okay, I'm just going to acknowledge the minutes. Okay. Very uh, good. And 13.2 uh, oh, was moved to next week. Uh, can I get a motion for adjournment? Uh, with Councillor Medeiros, all those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you.